I'm just gonna come in and just present. Should we check? Yeah. Yeah. Someone else check on the thing. That uh, thing doesn't look dodgy yet. This website is not using a secure connection. Who the hell cares? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, that's good. Are we working? are we live? Why yeah. not let me live? Are we working? We're competing with nine news. We are. I don't know if we can go with nine years. Yeah, yeah, then how good, are we supposed good. to see the chat? Should we pull it up on the computer? Pull up chat on someone else's computer. Okay, okay. Maybe we do need yours, Gavin. Maybe we need your computer. Do you want me to get it? Okay. Should we? This light is really weird. There's a slight delay. Wait, I'll just push all this stuff out. Wait, just turn this over. It's like showing. Just turn that one off. Clear the desk. We need three computers. No, we can't move that one. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. That's a camera. <laughs> we'll have the chat on Gavin's and then the slides on JJ. All right. Yeah, that'll work. Are we are we alive? What's I going? Don't this know. is I so don't know. weird. What's I assume going? we are. No, but we'll just wait a bit because it'll take some time for people yeah. to like join in anyway. People to come through the door. <laughs> 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 Someone from the lecture. <laughs> Violence in the back, guys. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, the link. I always think our link's broken. Yeah, my link wasn't letting me do it. Okay, let me see if I can get a better link. Uh, uh. Wait, let me let me try the link because I'll get it from like my probably. logged into my. Comment in the comments. Oh, oh God. God. internet. Or you can just link the YouTube channel and like maybe they can just go via the channel. Yep. Um, can someone else do that? Oh, I can't. I don't. I don't know what the link thing is. Like on super. Uh, I'll just. I'll just comment it under the post. Yeah. I'll copy it. What can I copy next? Help. Oh, Alright, actually, that's fun. I just put the link in. Oh, you link. just commented the yeah, link. Yeah, I just put the link into the actual post. But you're probably oh, logged yeah. in from PS Pen, like the actual subscription. You know I'll I'm just right? comment the link under the post. Right, one sec. I wonder if it's working. <laughs> Is anyone watching? Oh no. Uh, comment if you're watching. Not that we can see the comments yet, but <laughs> we'll work it out. <laughs> I'm gonna comment. What's going on? I think you're the most tech savvy dude. You really are. Okay, okay. I'll link okay, to the so channel this underneath. Link doesn't work. So you should just lie to me and say like this is a link to your stream because it's definitely not. Well, I just linked the channel so you can go by that, right? Yeah. yeah. There's 18 people watching. Oh, we have 18 people watching. We have 18 people watching. Come in. Oh, yeah, Gavin, come in. Just, yeah. just squeeze. We have to like squeeze. Oh. We have to really squeeze. Oh, I'm this is. Up a lot of space. <laughs> squish your face. Oh. We can like social distance a bit more when I'm like. Look at that. You can see us. Wait, so oh, now. oh, we're 20 watching. Okay. All right. Well, can you all hear us? <laughs> can we get everyone to test if we can hear yeah. us? Can we get Um, can people comment if they can hear us? Yeah. And see us properly and things are not technically, logically terrible? <laughs> There'll be a delay. Sounds good. But we'll give it a sec. We'll give it there, the delay. The channel, we can't see them. Yeah, this screen is staying on the chat. What's going on? Remember to guide your privacy in the sidebar. Maybe I'll just put something in the chat. Create a channel to join the chat. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> just say something. Can you not comment without. Can you not comment without the chat? Without having a channel? Yeah, oh, okay. Chat as Gabby. I mean, it's working, right? Are they people? It's working. Chatting. <laughs> doing like the lecture, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, someone commented, sound and visuals are all good. Ah, oh, brilliant. Nice. Great. Thank you. Great, great, great. Thank you. Great. Okay, should we get started then? Yeah. We'll, 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 let's power we'll, through. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll power through. The 18 right. people watching. Okay, so we're going to start off with 
Respiratory Anatomy. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us. <laughs> so, that's actually very true, we don't really need this one. Yeah. 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 Okay. So thoracic cavity. So you guys did some thorax stuff last year when you did cardio. Um, so a lot of this will be revision, but going back to it. Oh, it's audible. Yay. Um, going back to it. So the thoracic cavity in transverse section is about kidney shaped and the vertebral column produces an indentation at the back and it's divided into three compartments. You've got a pulmonary cavity on either side. And that contains the lungs and the pleura and then the mediastinum in the middle which you guys will have learnt about last year so there's the superior anterior middle and posterior and they contain your heart great vessels trachea esophagus and all sorts of other stuff as well so the pleura they're the serous membranes that line the lungs um, they're made up of simple squamous cells so it's a single layer and there's two parts to it there's the visceral part which is marked in red and that lines the surface of the lungs. It's tightly adhered to the lungs and it follows the fissures of the lungs as well. And then there's parietal pleura, which is in green, and that lines the internal surface of the thoracic cavity. Um, oh, also I should mention, if anyone has questions, post them in the chat. There's a little bit of a delay, but we'll try to answer them. Okay, so you've got the two parts to the pleura and then they're actually continuous at the lung hilum in the middle here. So even though there's two parts, they are part of one continuous sheet that just folds back on itself. And then in between the two layers, there's a little space um, colored in yellow, and that's the pleural cavity. And the pleural cavity contains a thin uh, layer of serous fluid, uh, which keeps lubrication between the two layers of the pleura, and it also maintains surface tension so that the lungs stay adhered to the thoracic wall. Otherwise, when you breathe in and expand your rib cage, the lungs wouldn't expand with it. Okay, um, so this is another picture of that. You can see the orange here is indicating the visceral pleura, um, and then that's continuous at the lung hilum with the parietal pleura around the outside, which has four different parts named according to what it lines. So it's pretty straightforward. The middle bit that lines the mediastinum is called the mediastinal pleura. The bottom bit that lines the diaphragm is the diaphragmatic pleura. The bit on the side here laterally that lines the ribs is the costal pleura. And at the top, you've got the cervical pleura. This diagram on this side shows what happens if air gets into the pleural cavity. So you've got your parietal pleura on the outside, the visceral pleura lining the lung. And you can see if you get air inside the pleural cavity, the lung collapses away from the thoracic wall. So that's called a pneumothorax. Um, this picture down here is an analogy for, I guess, understanding how the pleura folds back on itself. So remember that it's two layers, but they are continuous. So the analogy is often like punching a hand into a balloon. So the balloon is one continuous sheet all the way around. And then when you punch your fist into it, the layer of balloon surrounding the fist would be the visceral pleura. And then it's continuous at the wrist with the rest of the parietal pleura. So the wrist is like the hilum, the yeah. fist is like the lung. Yeah. Okay, so the parietal pleura. So you've got the four parts of the parietal pleura here again. Um, the important thing to know between the parietal and visceral pleura is the innovation and what kind of changes they can detect. So the parietal pleura is somatically innervated by the phrenic and the intercostal nerves. The phrenic nerve runs sort of centrally and quite anteriorly, and that innervates the mediastinal component of the parietal pleura and also the central part of the diaphragmatic pleura. The intercostal nerves are running in between the intercostal spaces of the ribs, so they innervate the costal surface and also the peripheral component of the diaphragmatic pleura. Because it's somatic innervation, the parietal pleura can detect pressure, pain and temperature, and the pain is well localized. Um, this is in comparison to the visceral pleura, which is, oh, it has visceral innervation, which is only sensitive to stretch, not pain, temperature or touch. Um, and sensation from the visceral pleura is very dull and diffuse, 
so it's very poorly localized. Whereas your parietal pleura, uh, pain there can actually refer to specific dermatomes, depending on what nerve is innervating it. So the cervical pleura is innervated by the T1 intercostal nerve, so pain will refer along the T1 dermatome, which is the medial side of the arm. Then the costal pleura will refer to the T2 and T10, or T2 through to T10 dermatomes, which just presents as like chest pain. And then the mediastinal pleura, that was the phrenic nerve, which has C3, C4, C5 as its roots. So the pain goes to the tip of the shoulder, the jaw, neck, and arm. And then the diaphragmatic pleura uh, can follow either the phrenic or the intercostal, depending on which portion of it it is. The pleural cavity, so I kind of mentioned this before, the pleural cavity has the serous fluid with its two main functions, lubrication so that they slide smoothly over each other. If there's a problem with that, for example, in pleuritis, then you get something called a pleural rub, which you can hear. Um, and then the fluid also produces surface tension to keep the visceral pleura in contact with the parietal. And when that is disrupted, you get a collapsed lung or a pneumothorax. Um, this is also another note that was sort of just in your anatomy question, so I just added it in. But the pleura is most vulnerable to penetrating injuries at places where it extends beyond the rib cage, basically. So the lung apices above, and then also the costo xiphosternal in the front and the costo vertebral angles at the back, where they're just sort of slightly unprotected. And also, of course, the intercostal spaces. Okay, lines of pleural reflection. This is not that important. Um, but I thought I would mention it anyway, just because it does come up sometimes. So this is basically areas where the parietal pleura makes a sudden turn. And then um, there's sort of like a sharp line at particular parts. So I've kind of this janky drawing down here in the corner that was done by me <laughs> to try to like illustrate it a little bit better because it's kind of hard to picture. But if you imagine this as a lung, You've got the sternal line here, which runs like anteriorly, and that is the separation between the costal pleura on the side and the medial, mediastinal pleura medially. Then you've got the costal line of pleural reflection, which is down the base here, and that's dividing the costal pleura from the diaphragmatic pleura at the bottom. And then this line at the back here is the vertebral line, which separates the costal pleura laterally from the mediastinal pleura again, medially. Um, the other thing is that the sternal line runs sort of centrally here, but it's different on the right and the left. On the right, it runs down to the sixth costal cartilage and then turns diagonally. On the left, because um, of the heart's position, it turns after the fourth costal cartilage to make way for the heart. This is important. So the lung and pleura surface landmarks, for some reason they love to examine this. Um, so there's a rule of twos and it's just talking about where the lungs and where the parietal pleura extend anteriorly, laterally and posteriorly. So um, starting with the visceral pleura, which is tightly adhered to the lungs, anteriorly at the mid clavicular line, they cross the sixth rib. So that's this one here. Then laterally at the mid axillary line, the lungs cross the eighth, eighth rib here. And then posteriorly at the mid scapula line, it should cross the 10th rib. And then, so six, eight, and 10, they're all two apart. And then the parietal pleura is just two below that. So anteriorly, it crosses at the eighth rib. So that's in blue. Laterally at the mid axillary line, it crosses at the 10th rib and then posteriorly it crosses at the 12th rib. So that's all summarized here. Rule of twos, six, eight, 10 for visceral, and then eight, 10, 12 for parietal. Where the parietal pleura extends beyond the visceral pleura or beyond the lungs, that's all potential space that can be filled with fluid. So they're usually sort of collapsed on themselves um, when there's not too much fluid there. And so you get sharp angles on an X-ray but if you get fluid building up in those areas, you get blunting of the angles. So this x-ray here, you can see you've got a really sharp angle and then the space is called the costophrenic recess. Um, so this side had a good sharp angle, whereas this side you can see it's a little bit more blunt 
and that indicates that there's a little bit of fluid sitting in that costophrenic recess, and that's called a pleural effusion. Okay, so the structure of the actual lungs. Um, so you've got a lung sitting on either side of the mediastinum. The left one is slightly smaller than the right because of the cardiac notch. So remember the position of the heart is sort of angled more towards the right, or sorry, towards the left. So it sort of intrudes on the left lung a little bit. Each lung has an apex at the superior end, a base at the bottom that sits on the diaphragm, some lobes, three surfaces, and three borders. Uh, the left lung, I remember it has two lobes because it's the smaller lung, so that kind of makes sense, and it has a superior and inferior lobe. And then the right lung has three lobes, superior, middle, and inferior. In place of the middle lobe on the left, you can see that's sort of where the cardiac notch is sitting. And so it sort of forms this tongue-shaped extension in the superior lobe. And so that's called the lingula, which means tongue, apparently. So surface anatomy. You can see this picture here again with the right lung and the left lung and they have fissures that separate the lobes so the oblique fissure is present on both sides and that separates sort of the inferior lobe from what's above it and then on the right side you have a horizontal fissure which separates the superior and middle lobe you can also learn that the horizontal fissure runs at the level of the fourth rib but that's not particularly important Okay, and then I also mentioned that the lungs have surfaces and borders. And again, these are sort of, they're just named according to like what makes sense and what it's in contact with. So the mediastinal surface, you can guess, is the medial surface that's in contact with the mediastinum. The diaphragmatic surface, you can guess, is in contact with the diaphragm. And then the costal surface is in contact with the ribs. And the borders, they're really the same as the lines of pleural reflection. So you have your anterior, which was your sternal, the posterior, which was the vertebral, and then the inferior, which was the costal. Okay, so left versus right lungs. They love to ask about differences between the left and right side. So I just put in some notes about important ones to remember. So the right lung is larger and heavier due to the position of the heart. Um, but it's also shorter and wider because the diaphragm sits higher on the right side. So you'll notice on chest x-rays, uh, the diaphragm extends a little bit higher on the right side and that's normal. The right main bronchus is also shorter and wider. So you can always just remember that the right side is like shorter and wider. Um, and it's also more vertical than the left, which means that if you inhale a foreign object, it tends to lodge in the right lung more so than the left because it falls more vertically with gravity. Um, specifically, if a patient is lying supine, so on their back, the foreign body tends to lodge in the superior segment of the right lower lobe. And that's just because the bronchus that's, uh, that supplies that segment is the only one that exits posteriorly. So if you're lying down and an object is trying to fall posteriorly, then it tends to fall into that segment. The anterior border of the left lung has a deep cardiac notch to make way for the apex of the heart, and that forms the lingula here in the superior lobe. Okay, the lung hilum. So, the lungs are attached to the mediastinum by the root of the lung, and everything going into the lungs passes through this root, and it contains the vasculature, it contains the lymphatics, the airways, the nerves, all of it. Um, this is also where the parietal and the visceral pleura fold back on themselves and it extends downwards that sort of join as the pulmonary ligament. So that's this thing down here. For some reason they like to ask about the arrangement of the hilum on the left versus the right so that you could hypothetically look at the hilum of a lung and identify which side it's from. Um, so if they do ask stuff like that, the main thing to remember is that the pulmonary artery is more superior on the left. So you can see this is the left lung hilum here. The pulmonary artery in purple sits quite superiorly, whereas in the right lung, it's sort of on the same level as the bronchus. The veins always sit most anteriorly. So veins will point you to which side is anterior 
Okay, so the tracheobronchial tree. Um, so this forms the passage that carries the air from your mouth all the way down to the lungs. It begins at the trachea and then it bifurcates repeatedly. So you need to know about what the divisions are called and then also what they look like histologically. Um, so we'll talk about some histology in a sec. But the trachea is sort of from the cricoid cartilage in the neck down to the sternal angle or your angle of Louis. Um, and it is held open by C-shaped cartilage rings. So you can kind of see them and feel them in your own neck. And then the back end, the free end of the ring is supported by a muscle called the trachealis muscle. Um, the bronchi, <clears throat> they arise at the sternal angle when the trachea bifurcates and then they go down to supply the right and the left lungs. And they also contain those C-shaped cartilage rings. Um, the left main bronchus I mentioned earlier is more horizontal, whereas the right one is more vertical. And the reason for that is because the left one has to pass under the arch of the aorta in order to reach the left lung. Once they're inside the lungs, they split again to get your lobar or secondary bronchi. So lobar because each one supplies one lobe of the lung. And now in, at this level, you don't have the C-shaped complete sort of cartilage rings. You just have sort of crescent-shaped islands of cartilage. Um, and again, I'll show you a picture of that in a sec. Later on, they then uh, separate further into segmental and tertiary bronchi. So these ones, they're called segmental because each one supplies one particular bronchopulmonary segment. And there's multiple of those per lobe. And these again have that crescent-shaped islands of cartilage. So here's a picture of that. You've got your trachea splitting down into the left and right main bronchus. So these all have those C-shaped rings in the red here. And then they separate into the lobar bronchi. Um, I think blue is meant to indicate inferior lobe, green, superior lobe, and then yellow middle lobe. And then they split further into your segmental bronchi. Okay, bronchopulmonary segments. I threw this in here, but you really don't need to know about this. You don't have to know the locations of these or anything. The main thing to know is just that each segment is independently supplied by its own segmental bronchus and branch of the pulmonary artery, and they're also drained by their own branch of the pulmonary vein. So each one is completely surgically resectable, as in you can cut out one segment if, for example, there's a tumor um, without affecting the other ones. Okay, bronchioles. So we've gone down from trachea to the tertiary or segmental bronchi, and then from there they split further into bronchioles, which are even smaller. And the segmental bronchi branch to form 20 to 25 generations of conducting bronchioles. So these have become like very tiny towards the end. Bronchioles no longer contain any cartilage, and these also don't contain goblet cells. So they end as terminal bronchioles. So you go from segmental bronchus to conducting bronchiole to terminal bronchioles. And then they then give rise to respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles are important to remember because they are the first division that's actually involved in gas exchange. Everything before that is just conduction. So terminal, I remember because terminal is like last. So it's the last one before you start doing gas exchange and then respiratory means like breathing. So respiratory is when you start doing gas exchange. Um, after the respiratory bronchioles, whoops, after the respiratory bronchioles, they give rise to alveolar ducts. So here you've got a terminal bronchiole going into a respiratory bronchiole and then alveolar ducts further down which are sort of just elongated pathways. And then each of those gives rise to five to six alveolar sacs, which are these clusters. And then each individual sort of bubble is an alveolus. And the alveoli are sort of tiny sacs, basically. And they're also lined by simple squamous epithelium. So it's a very thin layer of cells. Um, and they would actually have a very large combined air surface area. That's like a fun fact. It would cover a tennis court. Okay, <laughs> so histology. Um, so I mentioned before the difference between conducting and respiratory. So all the way down to the terminal bronchioles, they are just conducting air and controlling airflow. There's no gas exchange happening at those levels. From the respiratory bronchioles onwards, it's all for gas exchange. 
And this is an important distinction because they have different kinds of cells. So the conducting airways, they're lined with pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So the cilia is important and the uh, because it's for sort of like mucociliary clearance. And then columna is just like longer cells. Comparing that to the simple squamous epithelium, which is just a very thin layer of uh, cells, and that allows more effective gas exchange. Specifically, there's two types of cells, type 1 pneumocytes and type 2 pneumocytes. Um, type 1 are the simple squamous cells that are creating that surface for gas exchange. And then the type 2 pneumocytes, they're sort of specialty cells in the area, and they're simple cuboidal, um, and their job is to produce surfactant, which is kind of like a lubricant, which Kevin will mention in Fizz later. So the cartilage, we already mentioned the C-shaped rings, the plates of hyaline cartilage that are in the bronchi, and then no cartilage in the bronchioles. Nothing in the respiratory airways has cartilage. And then there's some other special cells as well involved, um, mainly for like mucus production. So this picture here shows it's either going to be trachea or main bronchus. And the way you tell is because you've got this sort of long, uniform, C-shaped cartilage inside the wall here. Comparing that to this bronchus here, which has sort of multiple plates of cartilage, and so that's staining purple. Um, but you can see there's not sort of one complete C shape. And then here you have bronchioles. So the bronchioles don't have cartilage in the walls, so they're a lot more irregular. And then over here you've got a bronchiole opening into an alveolar duct, and then each of these sort of bubbles is an alveolus. It's very hard to sort of see the pathway from alveolar duct all the way through to alveolus because it's a three-dimensional structure. So if you're looking at a 2D slide, you can't really see like where the pathway is going. But if it's sort of like a closed bubble, we call it an alveolus. And then if it's sort of this open space here, it's like a sac or a duct. Okay, so the layers from the air to the blood um, this is also important to know. So we've got gas exchange happening at the alveolus across the type 1 pneumocytes. So what happens is you've got air coming into the lungs and they first have to get past the surfactant layer, which is that sort of lubricating layer that was secreted by the type 2 pneumocytes. Then they get through to the type 1 alveolar epithelium. So they go through that cytoplasm of that cell. Then there's a basement membrane to cross. And then sort of in contact with the alveolus, you've got tiny capillaries. And so you go through the endothelium of the capillary into the plasma and then into the red blood cells with the hemoglobin molecules. And then those capillaries will join back up into uh, big pulmonary veins to go back to the heart. Okay, lung vasculature. So we're going to talk about the arteries and the veins and the lymphatics of the lungs. So starting with the arteries, remembering that in the lungs, the arteries carry deoxygenated blood, whereas the veins carry oxygenated blood. Um, so blood from the right ventricle here gets pumped into the pulmonary trunk up in purple, and that then bifurcates to your left and right lungs. And then the pulmonary trunk, much like the bronchus, I mean, it splits in a very similar way and the naming follows the bronchi as well. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, the pulmonary trunks, then they split into um, your secondary or your lobar arteries, and then they split into your tertiary or your segmental arteries. So again, the lobar arteries are supplying a particular lobe and the segmental arteries are supplying a particular segment. Once the blood has been oxygenated, it returns to the heart via the four pulmonary veins. Um, so you've got two pulmonary veins on either side. So these are shown in this sort of pinky color here. There's a superior and an inferior on either side. Um, there is one specific point that I don't think is super important, but it's worth mentioning. With the pulmonary arteries, um, the middle lobar artery, so the artery supplying the middle lobe, comes off the inferior branch. But when the middle lobe drains back into the heart, it joins with the superior pulmonary vein. So it, the artery comes off the inferior and then the a vein drains back to the superior. 
kind of just a weird distinction. Okay, so the lymphatics. Um, there's sort of main lymph nodes that you have to know just because of their implication in lung cancer, but that's really about it for lymphatics. Um, but to go into more detail, the visceral pleura and the lung tissue, they're drained by subpleural lymphatic plexus, which is deep to the visceral pleura. But more importantly, that all drains ultimately into the bronchopulmonary or hilar nodes. The bronchi and the vessels are drained by deep bronchopulmonary plexus, um, but that then also joins to the bronchopulmonary nodes. From there, the lymph travels to the superior and inferior tracheobronchial nodes. Um, I might show you the picture in this slide here. So you've got your deep and superficial plexus um, draining into the bronchopulmonary nodes, and they're called also the hilar nodes because they're located at the lung hilum, so they're around here. These drain into your superior and inferior tracheobronchial nodes. Tracheobronchial is pretty straightforward because it's the join between the trachea and the main bronchi. So that's here. And then these go up to your paratracheal nodes and then into the bronchomediastinal lymphatic trunks. And then they go back into the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct, depending on which side. Um, importantly for lung cancer, if uh, a cancer in the lung is it has metastasized to the lymph nodes, it tends to um, sort of cause expansion of these lymph nodes here the tracheobronchial ones, and then it causes widening of this uh, angle here. So it sort of distorts the bifurcation of the trachea. So that point there, the angle is normally called the carina. And if that angle gets widened, then it can be indicative of a lung carcinoma. Okay, innovation. We kind of already talked a little bit about innovation, definitely for the parietal pleura. But to go a little bit more into the lung themselves, you've got parasympathetic, sympathetic, and visceral afferent fibers. Parasympathetic coming from the vagus nerve, which you might recognize from last year. Um, the sympathetic coming from the sympathetic trunk, that's pretty easy. And then the visceral afferents, they can travel via either the vagus or the sympathetic fibers. So your parasympathetic fibers, they cause secretion of mucus from the bronchial glands, contraction of bronchial smooth muscle, and vasodilation of pulmonary vessels. The, sympathetic fib the sympathetic fibers do the opposite. Um, this is important in asthma because one of the treatments for asthma involves blocking the parasympathetic uh, system in the lungs and so that you get like decreased mucus secretion and relaxation of the bronchial smooth muscle to sort of counteract the effects of asthma. Your visceral afferent fibers, they're the ones that are conducting the poorly localized pain. So remember, they can only detect stretch because this is visceral. Okay, I've included the mediastinum slides here, but these are literally just the ones from last year. So you can have a look at them if you'd like some revision, but we probably won't go through them today. So mediastinum, and then just remembering sort of the list of things that you can find in each bit of mediastinum. <laughs> So the vasculature of the thorax, this is also a revision from last year, but I thought I'd just touch on it just because it seems to come up a lot in anatomy this year, um, and it's kind of confusing. I didn't probably learn it myself until second year. So um, the main ones you've got is you've got the aorta here descending sort of posteriorly close to the vertebral column, and off the aorta, directly off the aorta, you get the posterior intercostal arteries. So there's a branch coming off sort of for each rib. Um, and then you've got your subclavian on either side. So on the left, you've got the brachiocephalic. Oh, sorry, on the right, you've got the brachiocephalic, which then splits into common carotid and subclavian. On the left, you just directly have common carotid and subclavian. From the subclavian arteries, there's a branch called the internal thoracic or the mammary. Um, and that runs anteriorly down the front of the rib cage. And from there, you get branches, which are the anterior intercostals. So the intercostal artery supply is sort of, it's twofold. So you've got the posterior coming directly off the aorta, and then you've got the anterior coming off the internal thoracic, which runs anteriorly down the front, and that's a branch off of subclavian. Um, so that goes into more detail. You can look at those in your own time. Extra pictures. Veins of the thorax. Again, kind of a confusing thing, so I thought I'd touch on it again. 
Um, so this is the azygous system that drains like the thoracic cavity or the rib cage particularly, so the intercostals, um, and it's kind of a weird system. So on the right side, you've got this azygous vein. This is sort of the best picture I could find. So to orient you, you've got vertebral column, which would be running through here. Um, and then you've got the superior vena cava up here. And these horizontal lines are indicating the posterior intercostal veins. So on the right side, they're draining all into the azygous vein here, T2 through to T12. The one exception is T1. So the T1 intercostal on the right side, it drains directly into the SVC by the superior intercostal vein. It's not shown in this diagram, I think. Maybe it's this branch. It's not a perfect diagram. On the left, it's a bit more complicated. So you've got sort of three different components and each one drains four of the intercostals. So the hemiazygous um, is down here and that drains T9 through to T12 and then it joins the azygous at T8. Then you have the accessory hemiazygous which drains T5 to T8, and that joins the azygous at T7. Then T1 to T4 on the left-hand side, they drain into the left superior intercostal, which joins the subclavian as opposed to the azygous. So it's like kind of a weird roundabout system. Um, but again, it's something that comes up a lot in, anat in anatomy this sem, so I figured it's worth mentioning. Nerves, we covered this already, so phrenic nerve, C3, C4, C5, you have to know it, in, it innervates the diaphragm and also parts of the parietal pleura. Um, vagus nerve, parasympathetic innervation, it's a cranial nerve, there's a lot of detail there. <laughs> These are all Kevin's slides from last year. <laughs> Intercostals, yeah, I mean this is all revision so you can go back over this stuff in your own time. The lymphatics is important, um, but it's pretty straightforward. So everything in the lymphatic system drains into the thoracic duct with the exception of the right upper quadrant. So like the right arm, right side of the head and sort of a little bit of the thorax as well. Um, and so the lymphatic, uh, so the thoracic duct, which drains the whole rest of the body, that rejoins the venous system at the angle between the left internal jugular vein, which is going up to the head or up from the head, and the left subclavian vein. So it joins in there. Whereas on the right side, you've got the right lymphatic duct, which just does the same thing between the right internal jugular and the right subclavian vein. Okay, rest fizz. Okay. <laughs> do you want to swap seats? Yeah. We'll do that. All right. Um, did anyone have any questions? Oh, yeah, questions. At all first. from the respiratory anatomy? Um, not going to lie, this was a good break for us anyway, just to reorganize. It's quite squishy. <laughs> yeah, we'll give like 30 seconds, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just chuck them into the YouTube chat or just like comment on the post. Either works. Yeah, that works well. too. If you want to have a look. Um. But yeah, if not, if not, we might just keep going. Um, I no, think okay. I think we're good. I think we're all right. As you can tell, we don't know what we're doing. Um, <laughs> all right, let's get going. So respiratory physiology. So I guess this is a quick thing. If this like really confuses you, like still after this point, I guess, um, do give those lecturers notes a read. I'm hoping you guys have the same lecture as we did because they were pretty good. Um, a lot of these come from there, but if you're struggling, give those a read. Feel free to message us about it. But, um, yeah. So chest movement and changes in pressure. So this is basically kind of an overview in terms of how you breathe effectively. So when your chest expands as you breathe, the idea is that you increase the volume of the thorax, which decreases the pressure in the thoracic cavity, remembering this kind of P1, V1, P2, V2 formula. If volume um, increases, and this has to for this to match, basically pressure has to decrease for them to match. Perhaps. Um So as the diaphragm pulls all this stuff down, um, it causes the pressure to drop. Oh, did, or, we get a or, did we get a question? Is portal vein classified? classified as intraperitoneal? Um, that's abdo. <laughs> 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 it's very uh, random. Is portal vein? Yeah, it would be intraperitoneal. Right? Isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so it's interpersonal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why on earth you're doing abdo, but I mean, abdo is yeah. You go later. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, ahead of the ball game. We'll get Very there. ahead. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, the portal lane system is a bit different in comparison yeah. to how to think about things anyway. But um, yeah, probably is. Any other questions? Uh, just feel free to like. Yeah. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll stop see the questions. them and don't talk about them. Anyway, um, based upon I guess more breathing ideas. Um, so inspiration is active because it relies upon that diaphragm pulling it down effectively, whereas um, expiration is passive as you also kind of just relax the system. This is true except in intense exercise when you have muscles that also suppress the expiration phase and uh, best push air out of your lungs as well. Basically, as a simple sort of summary, um, breathing is relying on the ability to change the volume as it changes the ability to breathe, as just kind of a logistical thing or understanding how these numbers work. All of the pressures that I guess I talked about are relative to the lungs, where the lungs are based on the one atmosphere of being zero. So basically it says that normally your lungs are an atmospheric pressure, which is 760 millimeters mercury, but because no one ever wants to write 760 millimeters mercury every single time, they just write it as zero. So all the pressures described are in relation to that pressure. Um, especially the ones that are coming. The partial pressures of oxygen are different, but this is kind of like a quick go for that. Okay, so pleural air is in this pressure. So these are kind of important and kind of important to remember just because they assess it a lot. If you remember this picture um, and you can draw this picture, realistically speaking, it can help you basically just get what they're talking about. But there are effectively three areas. So intrapulmonary, um, which is basically just inside the lung. Intrapleural, which is inside the pleural space. So that imaginary space. Imagine it has like a little bit more of an space than it normally does. But that's when we'll talk about intrapulmonary. And then transpulmonary is that gap in between those two, or the pressure differential between those two. So normally intrapulmonary, um, this is the pressure of the air within the lungs at rest is zero millimeters mercury um, in comparison, because I guess it's equivalent to the atmospheric pressure outside. The intrapleural pressure, this is always going to be negative unless you have a pneumothorax. So at a negative of negative four millimeters mercury, and the idea is that is that if you have um, a positive pressure in here or a neutral pressure in here, the lungs doesn't adhere, adhere to the chest wall. And if it doesn't adhere to the chest wall, it can't expand and it would rather actually deflate down. Um, this will be talked a little bit more with pneumothorax stuff talked by Gavin um, or in some stuff already talked about by Elena. But this is effectively the mechanism they're talking about. And then transpulmonary, this just describes the differential. So this is this like pinky area on this graph. Effectively, we'll just know this graph and that will help you a lot with this kind of stuff. So chest movements, pressure and breathing. So as you inspire, the chest expands, which reduces the intrapulmonary pressure and the intrapleural pressure. Um, because the intrapulmonary pressure is reduced, gases want to reach an equilibrium. So gases want to go from an area of positive pressure to an area of negative pressure to basically equalize them. And so therefore the air kind of rushes in to the lungs to fill them and to equate that pressure. Um, the intrapleural pressure will continue to fall, and this kind of all depends on the diaphragm pulling the stuff down. And then when the diaphragm relaxes, the volume will therefore fall, which therefore makes the pressure now positive inside the um, lungs. That then drives the same process as the air pulling out, as it kind of goes out from the lungs into, I guess, the air. Um, that's effectively breathing. A um, whole bunch of things affect how easy, I guess, this is. And this thing, a term is called lung compliance. Compliance is the idea of how easy it is for the lungs to inflate and to basically um, fill up the air and expand, basically. So there are three sort of factors. Um, first is the idea of the ability of the muscles to overcome the resistance of the chest wall, the lung tissue and the airways. It's basically how stiff your lung is. Um, this will decrease tissue, tissue fibrosis um, caused by interstitial lung diseases um, or like silicosis from like um, silicon dust and stuff like that or asbestosis um, will cause this to become more difficult. Um, the ease of stretching... Uh, I've got another question. Okay, we have another question about so, more embryology. The question that. is, Lazarus mentioned pleural em plura embryology to explain why things are intraperitoneal or retroperitoneal. We need to know how or why aorta and IVC is retroperitoneal. Uh, that the whole intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal thing comes more into play in abdo. Yeah. But the idea with aorta and IVC is that they are are they secondary? No, they're just married. Oh, so they just develop retroperitoneally. Um. Yeah. So it's not really relevant towards the yeah. lungs or anything. How come you guys are having? Oh, I guess it's all embryology. Okay. 
Yeah, so like with respect to the question, mm-hmm. like plural embryology, I guess, explains it to some extent because it's, I guess, growing out. Like the heart and stuff is growing out, so it's going over. And therefore, the intraperitoneal and retroperitoneal stuff will develop that peritoneal structure. But in terms of like why that makes the aorta and IBC retroperitoneal, it can be thought of as a lot easier than like thinking of embryology, just because embryology is quite a complicated like process. Just think of it as like the aorta and IBC develop behind everything, so therefore they're retroperitoneal. Like that's effectively all you need to know about that kind of idea. Yeah, you don't um, really need to know how or why so much as just that it they is. are. The only sort of distinction you have to know is between like primarily retroperitoneal and secondary, secondarily mm-hmm. retroperitoneal. So secondarily retroperitoneal being structures that sort of start off kind of intraperitoneal and then they adhere to the peritoneum and in doing so they sort of become one with the peritoneum again so it becomes secondarily retroperitoneal. But for things that for structures that are primarily primary retroperitoneal you really just have to know that they develop behind the peritoneum yeah so it's the same idea as the kidneys the kidneys develop behind the peritoneum to their retroperitoneal by nature basically um but this will come out a little bit more we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the abdo yeah a lot later (laughs) 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 so yeah but it's like very much an abdominal sort of idea rather than a plural idea just because plural doesn't really have a retroperitoneal intraperitoneal it's not quite relevant yeah yeah but does that kind of answer the question like they sort of just are because they developed posteriorly um Mm -hmm. we can talk a lot more about that kind of stuff when we talk about the abdomen but in respect to like plural embryology you can think of it i guess as it kind of pushes it forward or the plural pushes forward and therefore everything else goes to the back but like more than that isn't super relevant or important at a second year level or as a third year level um, realistically, <laughs> or at anything um, below an embryologist, yeah, <laughs> sort of level. <laughs> yeah. um, if you want more questions with that, that, just keep messaging into the chat. Um, but we'll keep going. Okay, so there are three factors that sort of uh, deal with lung compliance. So the lung compliance is affected by the ability of the muscle to overcome the resistance, as I said, but it's also about how easy it is to stretch that parachyma of the lung. So lungs are normally elastic, but if there's an increase in the fibrosis from similar processes or collagen, or if it's thickened at all, um, this will also decrease the compliance as it basically just has more effort for it to move. Um, so I guess do you have the muscles to overcome that resistance or is that resistance just really big to begin with? You know, it's the differential between the first and second point. The third point is really important. So the idea is surface tension. So the surface tension of the air fluid interface lying in the alveoli, this contributes to two thirds of the lung compliance, um, where the elastic forces contribute to the rest of the third. So to overcome this sort of surface tension, the idea is that it would normally stick together and that would be hard to pull apart things. So if you can think about almost as if you have that glass, um, if you have a glass, film i guess if you ever have a glass film i don't know why you would but um oh, yeah i had that picture of the yeah glass the glass slide, film it. <laughs> yeah so the glass slide and then like a glass thing to try and pull those apart is really hard or if you have like a flat ruler on a table like to pull that flat picture. ruler off that table <laughs> will be really difficult the reason so therefore that surface tension is quite high the idea then of surfactant which is just this thing that type 2 alveolar cells produce, decreases that surface tension um, so that it doesn't collapse, so they don't collapse, and therefore you can have more easy opening, more easy, more uh, easier opening up of those alveoli. These, the production of this surfactant occurs in the sixth and seventh month of gestation, sixth and seventh month, month, month of gestation. Um, so premature births are given cortisol to stimulate this production so that they can have um, surfactant by the time they're born. Um, okay, so this is another factor that kind of improves or even issues your ability to breathe. So the airway resist, airway radius, and it's the same idea that kind of occurs with like arteries and stuff as well, because it's the same sort of formula and the same sort of, I guess, mechanism. But um, the radius of the airways decreases as you move down the generation. So the total cross-sectional area increases after generation 16. Um, the medium-sized bronchioles are the airways the greatest resistance. It's just something you should know and need to know, I guess. Um, importantly, the smaller the radius is, the greater the resistance. And that is a much larger effect than increasing the length of something will cause. Um, and this is quite a common question to get asked. 
and a very, I guess, easy one to get right, just because it's always the same exact question, talk about the same exact thing. Um, <laughs> but if you half the radius, this will increase the resistance by the power of four, so 16 times, whereas if you double the length, it will only double the resistance. And that's based upon the formula they show you, um, which you don't need to know. But effectively, the idea is if you make it thinner, that will cause a resistance to be greater than if you made it just longer, which doesn't do as much. This is the same idea as in arteries, so you get this idea back again when you talk about hypertension a little bit, when you talk about renal stuff, um, but that's effectively the idea there. Um, the bronchomotor tone helps, I guess, regulate this aspect, this, this idea. So the vagal efferents cause, bron bron cause bronchoconstriction, so the parasympathetic side of things. Um, inhaled stimuli can also do this thing, so cold, cigarettes, dust. Um, this is also kind of what happens in, I guess, like asthma and things, so like constriction. Um, sympathetic nerve supply and circulatory catecholamines cause bronchodilation. Okay, I feel like really low. Okay. All right, we're fiddling with tech still. <laughs> diffusion of gases. So there are five factors that sort of affect diffusion <laughs> of <laughs> gases. Um, okay, four of which are found through fixed law. You don't really need to know what fixed law is or the formula for fixed law, um, but these are effect four factors that are part of it. The last one, matching of ventilation and perfusion, is the one bit that's not in fixed law. So partial pressure of gases on either side of the membrane. So basically, if one side is more, um, it'll want to go there or want to go away from there. Thickness of the alveolar epithelium. So normally it's a very thin distance, 0.4 micrometers. I don't have a fun analogy to kind of explain how much that is. It's just very thin. Um, basically decreasing distance for which things need to diffuse across. Fibrosis or edema can cause it to become thicker and therefore makes gas diffusion harder. The area of the lungs. So basically if you think about it of surface area and absorption, similar ideas back in first year. But the more, I uh, guess, surface area you have, the more area you have for diffusion. Um, things like emphysema, emphysema or emboli will reduce that kind of idea. Um, emphysema is the idea of your alveoli basically destroying itself and becoming like bigger alveoli. Um, the issue there is that because of the bigger instead of like a lot of little ones, the surface area there is a lot lower, smaller. Emboli, the idea is that you're just blocking off a supply of like, like oxygen. Therefore, a whole area of alveoli can't get like oxygenated. Therefore, the area of that section can be completely disregarded. And the solubility of the gas. So different gases have different solubilities, as you hopefully should know. Like CO2, for instance, is more soluble than oxygen. Um, so therefore, CO2 is easier to cross rather than oxygen. And then matching and ventilation perfusion, which we'll be talking about soon. So partial pressures in the surgical system. So this is a little picture later on, which is, I guess, more easier to interpret and understand. But I guess the air we breathe in is normally a barometric pressure, so like basic atmospheric pressure. Um, and 20% of that is oxygen. So therefore, 20% of 760 is 159, which is where those numbers come from. So the air you breathe in has a partial pressure of 159 for oxygen and 0 0.3 for carbon dioxide. And it also means that at higher altitudes, these pressures are lower and that diffusion of oxygen is lower and vice versa for higher pressure environments as well. So if in a barometric chamber for therapy, more than anything else, that happened there. Once the air is breathed in, it's humidified um, and mixed with the air that's already in the alveoli, which drops that partial pressure. Because if you think about it, you're never just taking your first breath, right? Unless you're literally taking your first breath. Um, so therefore, there's always going to be air already there. So therefore, the mixing of that 159 with what's left already will cause to be 104 million of mercury for oxygen and 40 for CO2. You can think about just 140. Um, it then enters the arteries like a similar partial pressure and then over time as the arteries or as the cells take things away take oxygen away from the arteries it will fall and it will fall to a point of 40 millimeters of mercury for oxygen 46 millimeters of mercury for carbon dioxide then becomes the venous circulation and they burst back to the alveoli where it's a cyclical process and repeats itself so if you just look at this diagram here this is kind of what the area inspire this is an important aspect so these two are important and then as you scroll through this oxygenated o2 level just kind of falls and then goes forth to about 40 to 46, and then kind of gets back into the lungs and gets breathed out. These, realistically, are the only numbers you really need to know. The other ones are just there for fun, really. Um, okay, so ventilation and perfusion matching. So the idea here is that when your lungs hang in the body, they aren't uniform across the whole lung, but they're rather like a slinky. So that kind of childhood toy you used to have, um, or got given, um, is basically what we're looking at here. So the alveoli at the bottom are more compressed than those at the top. 
What that means is that when your chest expands, there's more air can go into the bottom regions of the lungs rather than the top, just because it can pull those alveoli open more. More blood will go to these lower portions of the lung as the pulmonary circulation also has the lowest pressure and so therefore they can go there easier as well. Basically, this is what it means by ventilation and perfusion matching. Um, and they will normally match to allow for efficient diffusion because otherwise if you don't have enough oxygen there, you won't have enough supply. If you don't have blood there, then you can't supply it as enough. Um, if it's normally it's at a ratio of 0 0.8, so VQ is ventilation over perfusion. Um, if it's lower, it's called shunting because it reduces ventilation, so from pneumonia or asthma. If it's higher than that, it's called dead space, and that's because there's reduced perfusion caused by things like a pulmonary embolism. Um, so mechanisms of VQ matching. So local factors will dictate what causes these things to happen. So capillaries collapse, if the PO2 falls, the blood is diverted to other regions where the PO2 is higher. Um, this is also true for the alternative, so if you have higher PO2, it will cause increasing blood flow. Um, bronchial diameter also occurs by the same thing, so this one is factored by carbon dioxide. So bronchioles will respond to the PoCO2 of the nearby alveoli. If it is elevated, there will be increase in diameter of its clearance. Um, and there's similarly the alternative true as well. This process is kind of the opposite of what happens in normal cells. So in normal cells, if you have, I guess, low PO2 or low oxygen, you want more oxygen in those cells. But here it's the other way around just because you want to supply those areas with more oxygen with more blood and more blood with more oxygen. Um, this process is also expected to have play a role in altitude sickness, but that's not really that important. Okay, so VQ lung scan. So this is a thing they do to test for pulmonary embolisms, technically. Um, in real life, they don't really. <laughs> they use a different thing. But the idea here is that they give you a gas to see how much you, um, a xenon gas, they take an x-ray to see how much that spreads throughout your lungs. Um, and then they should also do then do a injection of another radio like marker, um, take another x-ray into your blood. And that will also show up. And those two areas of lightness should match as your VQ matching occurs. Um, that area will then be the area that's like blocked off by the clot that's caused by a PE. Um, and that's effectively where VQ scan is. So it's a good example, I guess, of a, this happening in real life almost. Um, this is just a bigger version of that diagram I showed earlier. Um, it's a good one. Um, <laughs> oxygen transportation. So oxygen is transported both dissolved in plasma and cytoplasm and bound to hemoglobin. Most of it is bound to hemoglobin. So each liter of blood contains 200 mils of oxygen and an arterial pressure of 100 million of mercury. Um, some of it's dissolved, but it's not very dissolved soluble. So most of it's bound to hemoglobin, where there are four sites on each, like, um, binding site for each, on each, on each hemoglobin there are four binding sites for oxygen. Um, the oxidation saturation is the percentage of hemoglobin occupied by O2 and is measured using an oximeter. The ICU point, or the point where people start getting concerned and stuff, um, is a reading of 90. So 90% is concerning, I guess. Um, in real life, that can be lower, and some people can deal with that and manage that. But realistically speaking, for you guys, that is your ICU point or point when you're confused. The reason why is because that's a point curve that I'll show you in a second. Oxygen diffuses quite quickly in the blood, and that's important because it means that even you're at rest or when you're exercising, enough blood can diffuse through um, and work. Um, okay, so oxygen association. So uh, the association of oxygen is modeled on a sigmoid curve, so this curve here. And as the partial pressure of oxygen falls, so does the percentage of hemoglobin is bound to oxygen. In the lungs, there's a maximum kind of pressure, so 100% of oxygen is bound. So that's what causes it to kind of retract. As it moves through, the oxygen is absorbed, causing the partial pressure of oxygen to fall. And so does the amount bound to the oxygen. But only about to a point of 75%. That's important because it gives you a large reserve. So what I mean by that is this point here. So as we remember, the point in the body is at 40 mils mercury. So they Venus, I guess, supplies that 40 mils of mercury of partial pressure of oxygen. At that point, still 75% of the oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin, which is good because it means that we can have a bigger uh, reserve for if we need to drop the oxygen further, i.e. from exercise. The concern, however, is we get to this point here, between 40 and 20, your drop is quite severe. So if you're natively already at this point of 60 mils of mercury and 90, so the ICU point, if you collapse, I guess, a little bit more, every single little millimeter of mercury you lose, 
the more oxygen you lose, and that causes, I guess, poor perfusion, like cyanosis, and like that. And effectively, what we talk about here. Um, the curve is also relatively flat at its peak, so meaning even at higher altitudes, the oxygen isn't lost heaps. It is still reduced, and that's also, I guess, the factor that's concerning as well there. Um, so this is that curve. So factors affecting oxygen dissociation. So the factors that shift the curve right are all associated with exercise, and that's the way you can think about all these different factors. Um, so in shifting the curve right will mean for any given partial pressure, less hemoglobin will be bound, um, meaning it's easier to take away oxygen from hemoglobin. And that makes sense, right? Because in exercise, you want to have more oxygen pumping around so that you can do all the funky things you do um, when you're exercising. So these factors are an increase in PCO2, so which logically occurs in exercise. If you're burning more, using more oxygen, you're going to create more like CO2 and carbon dioxide. So therefore, that's going to logically increase. When you exercise, you also get sweaty and hot, um, more importantly hot. So you get an increase in temperature and that will also shift it right. You get a decrease in pH. So this can be thought as um, increasing in CO2, so carbon dioxide, which is actually acidic due to the reaction that occurs in. How that actually specifically works, you don't need to know right now. Um, that comes a little bit later when you're talking about acidosis and the kidneys again. Um, but just know that CO2 can be considered as acid in the body. The last one doesn't actually make any sense with the exercise analogy, um, but 2,3 DPG also increases, when it also increases, will also cause you to um, have a shift to the right. So basically, increase in CO2, increase in temperature, increase in acidity, um, or increase in 2,3 DPG. This is also termed the Bohr effect. Um, so they're asking you what the Bohr effect is, this is what they're talking about. Um, carbon dioxide transport and diffusion, um, not critical, but most of it is uh, as HCO3 to minus or bicarbonate, um, where they will remain electroneutral by swapping for chlorine ion. Um, when they need to be breathed out, this reverses to become CO2 again. It's more soluble than O2, um, as much, but it's, because it's at much lower pressure, it decreases at a very similar rate. But it's also fast enough so that it can do its thing. Um, so control of ventilation, so this isn't super, super important, um, basically it's controlled neuronally and chemically, but the neural control is, has a whole bunch of aspects, first and foremost in the medulla, there's a pacemaker control, um, and you guys can have a look at this in your own time, but this isn't super critical or important. If you have a look at this graph or this diagram, it explains and shows a lot of what you need to do. So the new intact center slowly breaking down, um, the epinephrine stimulates the inspiration, and therefore through these different nerves and neurons, it encourages and causes different things to happen. Um, I guess in terms of other things you want to think about, the vagus and glossopharyngeal nerves provide sensory input designed to protect the lung. Um, so these are the peripheral chemoreceptors um, that work. But this isn't super examinable. It's just I think that was on their slide. So here you go. Um, chemical control is a little bit more useful. So central receptors are located in the medulla and they monitor CO2, but they do so via H plus concentrations. So the central chemoreceptors are actually pH receptors, not CO2 receptors, because the CO2 is converted into hydrogen ions, um, which is detected. Um, peripheral receptors are located in the carotid bodies. These send information um, via the glossopharyngeal and aortic arch, um, and, or the vagus. Um, they monitor all of the three. Um, they more specifically respond um, to a decrease in PO2, increase in H ions or hydrogen ions, and um, the increase in CO2. In terms of oxygen, they only will respond to the oxygen when it really falls quite low. Once it is activated, it will cause a quite a large increase, but this very rarely happens to cause it to happen. So what I guess is the takeaway message is central and peripheral receptors will respond significantly to a rise in CO2 just because they could have worked together with that sort of response. So if you have a rise in CO2, you'll breathe a lot more. Um, whilst the central control is slower, it also has a much larger effect than the um, effect on, I guess, the peripheral receptors. So the respiratory drive is very much uh, influenced by carbon dioxide concentration. Yeah. That's what pushes you to breathe more. When your PO2 drops really, really low, then the oxygen concentration starts to drive your breathing. But normally speaking, it's the concentration of carbon dioxide that controls how rapidly you breathe. Yeah. But you have to like take note that for the central receptors, it's not a direct um, mechanism. 
So it has to be converted into H+, which allows it to go across a barrier and hence affect the central receptors and cause you to increase or decrease your ventilation. And what we mean by ventilation is really kind of just breathing rate. Yeah. Yeah. It's like how much you breathe. Yeah. This is a little diagram to showcase that same idea. Um, so carbon monoxide poisoning. So these will bind at the same size as hemoglobin, um, but they bind a lot tighter. What this means is that um, when there is a, I guess, equal binding, they um, will bound equally, sorry. There will be no cyanosis and the bright red blood is still there because there isn't any hypoxia detected. Even at 50% saturation with um, oxygen, it's difficult to get O2 to dissociate because of that curve. This is different to anemia because even with anemia, there'll be some dissociation as the curve is just sort of lower instead of this kind of higher curve where it's just broken. Um, entering hyperbaric chamber to increase the oxygen concentration can assist and basically help solve this problem. But this is effectively why carbon monoxide poisoning is dangerous. It's because your oxygen can't associate when it's bound. So even with like kind of a low, small amount of CO or O2, CO2, CO, carbon monoxide, that effect happens. Um, at higher ventilations, which is a completely different situation, um, people hyperventilate which will increase their O2, but they'll drop their PCO2 and become hypercapnic, which will decrease their ventilation or their ventilation drive, um, which is a problem, which is why you start feeling faint. Effectively. Okay, so spirometry. So this, um, this slide, I saw just a summary slide. This stuff you kind of need to know to have a bit of label. So just have a good look at this slide and I guess match the terms up to what they are. Effectively beyond that, there's not much I say. But these are important terms for you to know what they look like. So interpreting this from tree. So it can be fairly complicated, but for us, um, there's not too much you need to look at. So frankly, FE1, FEV1 and FEV1 over FEC or FER, which is the same thing as the ratio. Um, is all you really need to look at. So a decrease in the FEV1, FEC ratio is an obstructive disease. The logic here is that you're struggling to push out. So that's what FEV1 is. FEV1 is how much you can expire in the first second. Because you have an obstruction, it's harder to do that. But you still have a capacity that's normal, so the FEC, force vital capacity. So you can still get all the air to leave. Um, further, if this... Um, FEV1 over FEC is improved by bronchodilators, so your vent or um, puffers. Um, by 15% or more, this indicates that it's asthma rather than COPD, just because asthma is irreversible rather than COPD, which is irreversible. A decrease in the FEC indicates a restrictive disease, and the idea is that the lungs couldn't stretch enough or take enough air in, so therefore there's a decrease in the total volume they can sort of have. Um, these are just supplementary tests that you can also have. So DLCO is a lung function test used to measure diffusion, but it can also measure the total lung capacity that you have. So basically a small amount of carbon monoxide, not enough to do anything like bad that I talked about earlier, but enough to, for them to measure basically. And a small amount of helium is breathed in, and then they do some fancy math for that and they calculate things. So DLCO numbers are decreased by problems such as fibrosis as the diffusion rate is impaired. Um, TLC, total lung capacity, um, combined with the volume can give, I guess, an idea of gas trapping, which goes in cystic fibrosis and COPD, which effectively means the, lung, the amount of air that can't leave your airways and when you breathe normally. Um, flow volume loops are just another way to visualize from results. They're more commonly used, but they're not as commonly assessed, which is good. Um, but the important science is instructions is coving, which is an indent in the experienced portion of the loop. Um, just as a quick thing, flow volume loops look like that. So we'll get back to that. Um, this occurs because the first third of expression is driven by muscles, which is fine, but the rest is driven by the access to the lungs, which is reduced, and so therefore the expiration is reduced, therefore giving that coving effect. In restriction, the over pictures are just smaller but the same shape as before. Um, and then the last three are very much rare for them to assess, but they're just talking about different ways to obstruct. Um, and these are the pictures that you kind of can look at. So this is normal, um, this is the cone we're talking about, and then this is the restricted disease. So this dotted line here is a normal thing, so just smaller than what it was. Okay. Okay, we're back. We'll back. 
All right. Were there any questions on any, any of that? questions about the physiology? Because that was pretty intense. There's a lot of fizz. We'll give you guys a bit of time. Um, It'll become clearer. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier. The good thing is this is all recorded, so you can go back to it yeah. as things begin to make more sense. Because um, we know you guys have missed a fair bit so far. I okay. Think physiology, mm -hmm. like pictures, are very good. Yeah. Yeah. Pictures of things. Um, spirometry was probably one of the more important things to get the hang of. Um, out of all of those tests, DLCO and flow volume loop are less assessed. But you just have to be able to recognize coving mainly. All right, if there are any questions, oh, there is one here. We had a few post lecture exercises on calculating partial pressures at different atmospheric pressures. Is that examinable? I don't think we ever had anything like that. Yeah, no, I've never the, seen a question. We, yeah, we never had to do anything like that. Um, if it seems like they're placing a really big emphasis on it, then maybe it's just for your year and you should learn it. But for us, we really didn't have much focus on that at all. Mm. So I would say no. A tentative no. Okay, so we're going to move on to respiratory microbiology now. Um, particularly relevant given the current situation with coronavirus. Uh, so, <laughs> so we have different types of respiratory tract infections, and they're often just named based on where they are. And a lot of the names are very intuitive, right? So sinuses, sinusitis, bronchi, bronchitis. But I've just highlighted the ones that are maybe a little bit less intuitive. So rhinitis refers to infection of the nose, otitis is the ears, stomatitis for the mouth, glossitis for the tongue, and pneumonia is specifically talking about the alveoli or the interstitium. So that's a lower respiratory tract infection. That's just terminology. So here's the list of upper respiratory tract infections. For each of these, you need to know the etiology, so the bugs involved, the transmission, it's almost always respiratory droplets, uh, pathogenesis, so how it causes damage, clinical manifestation, the diagnosis and the treatment. So we'll start with the most common and the least severe, the common cold. So this is primarily viral, 50% caused by rhinovirus or coronavirus. The other 40% caused by other viruses and then only 10% are bacterial. So that's why you don't give antibiotics typically for the common cold. Transmission, direct contact or droplet inhalation and the mechanism of damage uh, the pathogen does infect and lyse the um, ciliated columnar epithelial cells, but really the main mechanism for the symptoms is immune response. So the immune response, which is leukocyte infiltration, edema, oh, we just got to thank you. Thanks, David. That's really nice. Um, edema and inflammatory mediators like bradykinin, that's what causes the symptoms. So bradykinin specifically makes you cough. Um, clinical manifestation, the common cold can have a 12 hour to two day incubation period. It's pretty short. Um, and then diagnosis is usually clinical. You rarely need a lab diagnosis for it. And the treatment is very much just symptomatic stuff. Hand washing to prevent further transmission. Very important. <laughs> pharyngitis and tonsillitis. So we're gonna move just gradually down the upper respiratory tract for ease. So pharyngitis and tonsillitis, I'm sure many of you will have had before. Again, it's predominantly viral, but there's about 10 to 30 percent of cases that are bacterial, and they tend to be uh, group A, C, and G strep, Neisseria gonorrhea, Haemophilus influenzae. The main one you have to know is strep pyogenes, because pharyngitis from strep pyogenes is associated with a whole host of complications, um, because it is a group A beta hemolytic streptococcus. That's what that all means. Transmission is the same. Clinical manifestation. So this is not a hard and fast rule, but it is typically used to differentiate between what is likely viral and what is likely bacterial. So viral tends to be more diffuse. You get a sore throat, but it's a little bit less severe. And then bacterial is a more sudden onset, painful tonsils with white pustules, a high fever with chills and tender lymph nodes. Um, and this makes a difference to treatment. So if someone comes in with swollen tonsils, but otherwise it's not so bad, then it's very much just symptomatic treatment, maybe a bit of painkiller, rest, that's about it. If, however, a bacterial cause is suspected, 
um, antibiotics are necessary. So oral penicillin for 10 days or erythromycin if they are allergic. The problem with strep pyogenes is that it has a whole bunch of complications associated with it because it has this beta hemolytic function where it can lyse red blood cells, so burst them. So the complications are classified as suppurative or non-suppurative. Suppurative means it produces pus, so it's basically just like infection spread to other areas, the ears, nose, and the airspace in the mastoid bones or peritonsillar abscess, which is basically like a pocket of pus near your tonsils, and that's called quincy. Um, these we care a little bit less about. We care more about the non-suppurative complications because they're a bit more concerning. So scarlet fever is caused by particular strains of strep pyogenes that have a phage or a bacteriophage in them that codes for an erythrogenic toxin. So that is a toxin that produces heat and redness. So it causes this like red rash all over the skin and this strawberry tongue because um, it's red and spotty. You can also get acute glomerulonephritis one to two weeks after the sore throat. So we know that the immune response involves like antibodies binding to the bacteria to sort of flag them for phagocytosis. Well, those immune complexes can sort of flow around the blood and deposit in glomeruli. So they sort of just lodge there and they activate inflammation in the glomeruli, which then causes damage. So you get blood and protein in the urine and it can cause death in months. Another problem is rheumatic fever. So this arises two to four weeks after the sore throat. Um, and this is when the streptococcal cell wall, it has a close resemblance to heart tissue and also some other cells. And so antibodies that you make against the streptococcus will also cross react with the heart. And so you can get myocarditis, infection or inflammation of the heart muscle or pericarditis, which is of the sort of sac around the heart. Repeated attacks can then progress to rheumatic heart disease where you get damage to the heart valves and that leads to lifelong morbidity. So stroke pyogenes, you have to watch out for all of those complications. Okay, diphtheria. This is very rare in developed countries, but for some reason we still have to know about it, probably because there's a vaccine in involved. Um, so it's caused by toxin producing strains of Carinobacteria diphtheriae. So the name makes a lot of sense. Transmission, respiratory droplets, and this one, it multiplies locally, so it doesn't invade further, but it produces a toxin, and the toxin causes damage to epithelial cells. And that damage particularly creates foul-smelling necrotic exudate. So necrotic is cell death, and it smells bad because the cells are dying. Um, and that exudate can seal off the patient's airways, as you can see here. And they also get big swollen cervical lymph nodes that gives this sort of bull neck, thick sort of neck appearance. This is a medical emergency because this exudate here can completely occlude the airway so the person can stop breathing. So if you see it, the patient has to be isolated, an antitoxin is given immediately, and then antibiotics, um, and you just have to sort of keep watching out for obstruction. If obstruction occurs, you do a tracheostomy or intubation to help them breathe. And because this is rare in developed countries, it's a notifiable disease, so you have to do contact tracing and like prophylactically treat people who have been in contact and stuff like that. But it's rare because we have a routine childhood vaccination that protects against it. Glandular fever, another one that some people might be familiar with. It's caused by Epstein-Barr virus um, and it's transmitted by saliva. So it's common in young children who are sort of salivating all over the place and teenagers who are salivating all over each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the virus remains latent in B cells and it can get reactivated during immunodeficiency. This one's particularly important because it can progress to cancer. So it's associated with Burkitt's lymphoma, which is a cancer of B cells. The clinical manifestation of glandular fever is it's just very slow building and prolonged. If anyone's ever had it, it can last like months. So it's a slow onset of fever, anorexia, lethargy, sore throat, headache, and lymphadenopathy. And then also like enlarged liver and spleen because they're sort of immune. They're involved in like the immune system, right? Diagnosis. You might see atypical lymphocytes on a peripheral blood film, but that's not very specific for EBV. So the gold standard is this sort of monospot, monolert test for heterophil antibodies or serology. There's no treatment, there's no vaccine, it's just a spontaneous recovery with rest 
after two weeks to a few months. Acute laryngitis. Um, so this one, again, usually viral, again, respiratory droplets. Clinical manifestation is very similar to the common cold, but the key sort of buzzwords for laryngitis are a hoarse voice and a barking cough because your larynx is where your vocal cords are. So if you have like inflammation in that area, then your voice is affected. So hoarse voice and barking cough. Um, clinical diagnosis and the treatment is symptomatic. You rest the voice. Humidification to try to like ease comfort um, but that's about it and then croup is sort of it's a combination of a bunch of things so it's acute laryngotracheobronchitis so it's all the way from the larynx all the way down to the bronchi this one is most commonly caused by parainfluenza 1 to 3 um, and it, importantly for you guys it's specific to children aged 3 months to 3 years so it's very buzzwordy in exams if it's a very young child particularly with like a barking cough and some strider, it's probably croup. Um, the clinical manifestation, there's basically a danger of airway obstruction. Um, and that's because the airways in children are much narrower than in adults. So if they're getting inflammation of their airways, you have a much higher risk of obstruction. Um, so you've got the fever, the barking cough because the larynx is involved, restlessness, it's just a baby sign, I guess. And then strider and respiratory distress. So respiratory distress because they can't breathe well enough. And then strider, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with, but it's kind of like wheeze, but it's inspiratory. So it's a sound on inspiration, whereas wheeze is a sound on expiration. Diagnosis, <clears throat> it's done via a laboratory diagnosis of a nasopharyngeal swab for antigens. And then the treatment is mainly symptom uh, symptomatic, but you're trying to maintain the airway. So if you're worried about occlusion, they might use steroids and nebulized adrenaline to try to relax everything. Um, and also you might give antibiotics if you're worried about a secondary infection. Acute epiglottitis. So this one is another medical emergency. So the epiglottis is this sort of structure in the throat that's blocking off the airways when you swallow. That's what's responsible for making sure that your food doesn't go down your windpipe. Um, and infection and inflammation of that structure can cause, again, complete occlusion of the airways. This is usually Haemophilus influenzae type B, respiratory droplet transmission. Um, and the clinical manifestation, it's kind of some extra like weird ones. So drooling, um, difficulty swallowing because there's an obstruction and respiratory distress and strider again because obstruction. Strider tends to suggest obstruction. Um, so the cellulitis, so the infection of the epiglottitis or the epiglottis and the adjacent structures, that can cause sudden complete airway obstruction. So that's why this is a medical emergency. And importantly, you can't attempt a throat culture. So you wouldn't try to like swab the throat because then you're increasing the risk of airway blockage if you're irritating the area. So you do a blood culture instead. Um, it's treated with antibiotics intravenously um, instead of orally because they probably have problems swallowing. Um, but it is one of those ones that is preventable with a vaccine. Sinusitis. This is kind of like a subset of other infections. It tends to occur with other things. And it's infection of the sinuses. So they get facial pain like here and up here where you have your facial sinuses. It can be caused by a whole host of viruses and bacteria. Hospital acquired if they've been in hospital. Um, you don't really have to learn those too much. But the main thing is it tends to be viral um, and it's also a symptomatic relief. Otitis. So otitis, remember, is infection of the ears and you can get external, the <laughs> external ear or media, the uh, middle ear. So otitis externa can be acute localized, acute diffuse or invasive. And this is sort of like increasing in severity. So acute localized is caused by Staph aureus. So Staph aureus is normal flora of the skin. So if it's causing an infection, it tends to do so like because it's from the skin. And what you get is like basically a pimple in the ear. So you can see it's like not really that big of a deal. It's a symptomatic treatment. And then it's sort of very chill. Acute diffuse otitis externa is also called swimmer's ear. And this is caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, other gram negatives, Staph aureus or fungus. And this one, you get sort of swelling of the ear, it goes red and you get discharge. So that's what's happening here in this picture. Um, again, though, it's symptomatic treatment with like those eardrops. 
Um, invasive or malignant otitis externa. This is almost always caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa and it tends to only happen in people who are immunocompromised. So elderly, the diabetic, or people who are on like chemotherapy and stuff. It causes a severe necrotizing infection. So that means it's sort of killing all the cells in there. Um, and then that can spread to the adjacent soft tissue. This is more of an urgent problem and it's treated with anti-pseudomonal antibiotics in the form of eardrops. Um, and also they can give steroids or systemic antibiotics if it's very severe. Otitis media, so this is further in the ear canal into the middle ear, it tends to be viral, particularly RSV, so respiratory syncytial virus. Um, but if it's persistent, it's more likely to be bacterial. It usually follows up a respiratory tract infection. So infections from um, sort of the mouth and nose area can spread into the ear. And you get sort of inflammation and fluid in there. So what happens is when they look through with like an otoscope, they can see the eardrum looks like this and it's sort of bulging and opaque, whereas normally it's very uh, sort of clear and shiny, like you can see through it. Um, translucent, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, the diagnosis is clinical, you, I mean you see it with the thing, and then the treatment is very symptomatic initially, but if it's persistent, then it's more likely to be bacterial, so they'll give some antibiotics. Okay, lower respiratory tract infections. So this is the list of them, again you have to know sort of the same things. Whooping cough, we'll start with this one. So this is caused by Bordetella pertussis, a gram-negative cocobacilli, and it is commonly seen in children. It attaches to and multiplies in the ciliated respiratory mucosa, and it produces toxins that affect the inflammatory processes and damage the epithelium. This one, you just have to know that it's got this sort of specific pattern in terms of its clinical manifestation. So you've got an incubation period of one to three weeks. Then there's this catarrhal phase that is like basically resembling the common cold. And then you've got a paroxysmal phase where you get the severe episodic cough, severe enough to cause vomiting, um, and the characteristic inspiratory whoop. Um, and then that's followed with a convalescent phase, which is just like recovery over a couple weeks or sometimes months. Um, the problem with this is that it is most infectious in this early stage when it resembles the common cold, and that stage is also the best time to do a pernasal swab for diagnosis. So uh, oftentimes people present a little bit too late because they tend to present in the paroxysmal phase. The treatment is with azithromycin um, and also supportive care, and this is also preventable with the DTPA vaccine in combination with diphtheria and tetanus. Bronchiolitis. So bronchiolitis is another one of those childhood ones. So it affects children under two years um, and it's mostly caused by RSV. The clinical manifestation. So because you've got obstruction of the bronchioles, it's restricting air getting to and from the alveoli. So they get a wheeze and they get respiratory distress. It makes sense. Diagnosis. Uh, you look for the antigen in nasopharyngeal aspirate. And treatment is supportive again. If it's severe or high risk, they might give a nebulized antiviral. Um, and there's no real vaccine, but if someone is at high risk, then they might give them this antibody injection as a sort of preventative measure. Bronchitis, this one's much more common. So this is uh, typically a viral infection, typically spread by droplets. Clinical manifestation is usually cough as the main presentation. Um, and it's considered chronic bronchitis if the symptoms persist for more than three months and it's not attributable to a specific disease. And chronic bronchitis is an element of COPD. Um, diagnosis and treatment. Diagnosis is very clinical. Uh, cough and thick mucus tends to be bronchitis. Um, and then treatment is also very symptomatic based. If it is, uh, like if the person's at risk of a secondary bacterial infection, usually if they're like immunocompromised or something, you might give them some antibiotics as a sort of prophylactic treatment. For chronic bronchitis, they tend to need bronchodilators, so like a Ventolin. Okay, pneumonia, the one that everyone worries about. Pneumonia is inflammation of the lungs with consolidation. So it's infection of the alveoli or the interstitium. Um, and it can be basically any kind of pathogen, like all sorts of pathogens can cause pneumonia. Uh, we typically classify pneumonia according to like its x-ray appearance. So you've got lobar here, which is where you get consolidation or that sort of 
um, opacity in one particular lobe. It's sort of very localized. Interstitial looks like this. It's sort of spread all through the interstitium of the lung. It's bilateral, it's symmetrical. And then bronchopneumonia uh, looks like this. So it's diffuse, it is bilateral, and it's sort of got this patchy appearance that's different on the two sides. The treatment for pneumonia is penicillin and doxycycline until the causative agent is identified, and then you might modify to a more specific treatment. Um, another classification we sometimes use is typical versus atypical. So this is talking about categories of pathogens that present in either a typical way or an atypical way. This is less so used now because it's sort of recognized that you can't really classify the pathogen based just on presentation, but the term gets thrown around a lot, so we still learn it. Um, your typical presentation is more of an abrupt onset versus a gradual in atypical. The symptoms are kind of similar, but typical tends to be more severe. You get a more purulent sputum, shortness of breath, whereas atypical can be a little bit more vague and nonspecific. So systemic type symptoms, fatigue, all that sort of stuff. Physical findings can be very normal on atypical, but on typical you might find a rapid respirate because they're short of breath. Uh, the sputum, this is really just a buzzword thing. It's more purulent in typical organisms, more watery or mucopurulent in atypical. The x-ray findings tend to vary as well. Penicillin is more useful in typical. And then also sputum sample culture is more useful in typical because the causative agents of atypical pneumonia can't always be grown on simple culture media. So this is the list of your typical versus your atypical agents. So streptococcus pneumonia is the most common one, and that can affect sort of all kinds of people. And then you've got Haemophilus influenzae and Klebsiella pneumonia, which tend to affect people with COPD, alcoholics, and the elderly. Again, buzzwords for exams. Staph aureus is commonly seen in IV drug users, because remember it's skin flora. And then Pseudomonas aeruginosa is typical for cystic fibrosis. They sort of almost always have Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Atypicals wise, mycoplasma pneumonia is the most common one, but you also get, uh, get chlamydophila pneumonia from birds and Legionella pneumophila. Um, Legionella, the buzzwords for this is cooling towers, ACs, and also potting mix apparently is in infected with Legionella. Uh, Coxiella bonetti, chlamydophila trachomatis, and then the viral ones, including coronavirus. So let's talk a bit about viruses. So we've got influenza here. Influenza is probably your most common one. It's an enveloped SSRNA, so single-stranded RNA virus. Um, the clinical manifestation, you guys can probably guess, the transmission, respiratory droplets, diagnosis, clinical, treatment, symptomatic. <laughs> Um, there are antivirals for influenza, but they're not really routinely given unless someone has very severe symptoms. And you can prevent influenza with the influenza vaccination, but that changes every year. And that is because influenza has a really big capacity for genetic change. It has these two proteins here, hemagglutinin for cell entry and neuraminidase for cell release. Um, and then these proteins can sort of mutate throughout time and they can mutate really easily. Um, so that's why like when you talk about like a H1N1, it's referring to like hemagglutin one and neuraminidase one, like different variations of those proteins. So the genetic changes can result from antigenic shift or antigenic drift. Drift I think is like, it's more chill, so it's less severe. And that's when the virus evolves by like point mutations. So there's just like slight changes. And that means that your old antibodies aren't effective, but there's still sort of some protection. And then antigenic shift is the more severe one where you've got multiple subtypes sort of joining together or recombining to form a brand new virus, which is immunologically distinct from previous circulating strains. And this is what tends to cause pandemics. This is what tends to happen when um, a virus from an animal moves to infect humans. That tends to be antigenic shift. Complications of influenza include pneumonia and then all sorts of other stuff. Coronavirus. So coronavirus is a family of zoonotic viruses. Zoonotic meaning that they typically infect animals. Um, and they can cause anything from the common cold through to like severe respiratory syndromes. The typical examples of those, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and now COVID-19.
Um, the latter two coming from China, originating from China, and then the first one originating from the Middle East. So these should be suspected if a patient has recently traveled to these particular areas. This is kind of out of date now, because I guess for COVID-19, it's sort of it's sort of like if they've traveled anywhere. <laughs> um, and Italy, I guess, would be another big one to add on the list. Um, but yeah, this was sort of more for MERS and SARS. MERS was associated with camels and raw camel products. SARS and COVID-19 were associated with bats. The clinical manifestation, similar to influenza, you get high fever, cough, shortness of breath. That's sort of like the big trio. Uh, people with like a runny nose are probably unlikely to have coronavirus. Severe cases can lead to pneumonia, as we know. Diagnosis is by PCR or serology. There's no specific treatments. It's very much supportive care if they need like oxygen and fluids. Um, and there's no vaccine either. And airport screening is very important. Or I guess in the example of coronavirus, it's like airport shutdown is very important. <laughs> Cystic fibrosis. Um, so this one, you guys talk a lot about, and we talk a lot about as well, but it's actually kind of low yield for us, which is disappointing. So cystic fibrosis is the most common lethal inherited disorder among Caucasians. It's present in one in 2,500 live births. This is the mutation to remember, Delta F508, deletion of the three nucleotides encoding a chlorine channel. <laughs> Ultimately, it's a chloride channel. Um, and so what happens is there's a defective chloride channel and that causes abnormally thick mucus, which then causes like clogging up and obstruction of different structures. So clinically you get lung damage, bronchiectasis, so dilation of um, the alveoli. You get impaired mucociliary clearance because of that thickened mucus. It doesn't sort of expel pathogens as effectively. And you get chronic colonization because the stasis of the thick mucus in the bronchi uh, makes it easier for pathogens to colonize. And the most common one is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, colonizes all patients by 15 to 20. Diagnosis, children are routinely screened for CF at birth by a blood test, and then adults can be diagnosed by the sweat test or by genetic testing. Treatment, there's a whole host of treatments for cystic fibrosis. So it ranges from like symptomatic stuff with bronchodilators to like physiotherapy to aid with mucus expiration and nutrition. Um, and that's because they have problems with like fat digestion. Infection management. So oftentimes they might get given like prophylactic antibiotics and stuff to try to prevent infection. Uh, vaccinations are also really important for people with cystic fibrosis. And then they can give drugs to counteract mutations um, and lung transplants as sort of altering the, the course of the disease. So there's sort of new experimental drugs now which try to actually counteract the genetic mutation. Um, but they are very much experimental, so I'm not sure. <laughs> Tuberculosis, again, a thing that's not very common in Australia, but they seem to focus an awful lot on. Um, it's caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. You get granuloma formations. Um, and so the big sort of epidemiological thing to consider is a travel history, just because it's so uncommon in Australia. Um, and then there's sort of two phases. Primary TB is characterized by gone foci, which are these localized granuloma in the lungs, um, particularly in the middle or lower lobes, and they contain necrotic or caseous tissue. Um, but most individuals are asymptomatic. And then what happens is they get a secondary infection with lowered immunity. Um, and here it migrates to the apex of the lungs up here, and you get sort of erosion into the bronchus and these very sort of characteristic x-ray changes. Symptoms, fever with chills, general malaise, night sweats. This is all very buzzwordy. Wasting away is the big buzzword. And then of course, if there's a travel history, that's sort of like equals tuberculosis. Diagnosis wise, there's all sorts of different tests, but they have different uses. The gold standard is quantiferon gold, um, but the problem with it is that it can't distinguish between an active or latent infection. It just shows if there are cells reacting to the TB. In order to diagnose an active infection, you need to do a sputum sample and spear microscopy. So that's a common exam question. And then on a chest ray, you'll see granulomas and a biopsy will show caseous necrosis, which is a cheese-like necrosis. And that's also a buzzword. Treatment. So here is the treatment. The mnemonic is RIPE, 
rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. You can look through those in your own time. Um, but as long as you remember ripe, you'll be all right. Lung abscess and empyema, they're sort of like pus-related infections. So an abscess is a pus-filled cavity in the lungs, and then an empyema is pus in the pleural space. These are not really that important for you guys, so you can have a look over them yourselves if you'd like. All right, on to immunology. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Feel free to ask any questions. Microbiome is very much just like rote learning, unfortunately. It's a lot of stuff. It's kind of a pain. Okay. Go we'll get through it. it. Um, <laughs> we're probably running over time. So no, we said we wanted to be halfway at this point. Oh, we're, yeah. yeah, we're about halfway. Yeah, yeah, no, we're good. Okay. All right, so restriction <laughs> defenses. So I guess there are two sort of ways you can think about this sort of structure. Um, there are upper respiratory tract and lower respiratory tract sort of defense systems, I guess. Um, the mucociliary clearance is quite common. It's quite important. Um, but we'll look at these a little bit more in a second. Um, the ones that are highlighted anyway. The other ones aren't super important. Um, yeah. Cool, so lymphatics of the respiratory system. So the lungs are drained by an array of lymph nodes um, that we were talking about before. Um, but around the throat, there's a ring called wild Bayer's ring, um, which is also lymphatic tissue. In the respiratory, the respiratory system, um, there are bronchus-associated lymphoid tissues, which are located in the subepithelial tissue in the lamina propria, which I guess is just this area here underneath like, the top layer. Um, in a cross-section, you can see this kind of structure, I guess, underneath the epithelium. And these are filled with B and T cells. Um, these drain lymph nodes, but they can also dra generate an immune response from here. Um, Whilst these lemon appropriate isn't lymphatic tissue, it's also important for the response because it's rich with rich, rich typo, um, with thylacin cells, affected T cells, macrophages, and mast cells. So basically, this is all a very immunological stuffed area. Um, mucociliary transport. So I guess this is, I guess, the movement of the mucus linings. Um, these are important as a sort of innate system um, or the primary. Called. Um, but first line defense, I guess, sort of idea where um, the mucus will trap things and then we beat it out of the system. Um, so the goblet cells secrete the mucus and the cilia will beat it out at a centimeter a minute. Um, between these cells, there's these junctions. Um, but this idea is that these will trap microscopic particles, um, but it'll also trap other things such as um, cigarette smoke and other particles. Um, and when this is has a problem with it, for instance, could be chronic inflammation damaging this stuff through bacterial and viral infections or smoking, um, or a inherited condition of emotile celiac syndrome, or in say cystic fibrosis where this is just too thick to beat, um, it can cause a recurrent or it can cause the susceptibility to recurrent respiratory infections. Okay, so looking at the innate immunity um, of the, I guess, second line sort of idea, um, we're looking at respiratory epitheliums can be expressed um, pattern recognition receptors, um, which recognize PAMPs. So these are things that are on bacteria or viruses that they can just respond to. Um, when bound, these secrete cytokines and chemokines, um, which will cause a secretion of defenses, but also an activation of immunity and an activation of other immune cells to recruit. Um, they also improve the bacteria barrier integrity. And so the idea here is that effectively that these receptors are part of the immune system and part of the immune response and it will help. Um, there are also macrophages which will cause, um, which phagotize phagocytose particles, including smoke, which can cause hyperactivation, which can cause COPD due to chronic inflammation. Um, these also express receptors to reduce other cytokines and chemokines to other immune cells. Importantly, neutrophils. These aren't normally seen, but when they are there, they can secrete nets, um, and in pneumonia, they will die, causing development of pus in the lungs. In terms of its active immune system, um, the idea here is that, well, if there's such a strong barrier, how does this adaptive immune system sort of work? And well, the idea is here is that the injuric cells, so the um, antigen presenting cells, can secrete like or extend processes through to capture antigen in the lumen. Um, next to these bolt areas, there are also M cells, so this is what this segment is trying to show, which I guess um, can transfer antigens across the cell, which can activate and spread that kind of antigen across. Um, I guess, sort of, sort of importantly, cytotoxic T cells will kill viral infected cells, but different um, 
types of help T cells will secrete different types of cytokines and chemokines and receptors like that, and will cause a better activation for different sort of pathogens and allergies. These first two are sort of the most important, I guess, but these are all quite um, classical. So TLA4-1 is for intracellular pathogens, TLA2 is for like parasites, but also cause allergies. TLA17 is for extracellular pathogens, which is basically bacteria and like that. Um, so types of IgA. So different T cell cytokines will cause the activation of different plasma cells. Um, both IgA and IgE are secreted, but IgA is important in the mucosa. Um, IgA is, the important aspect of IgA is that it's not inflammatory, um, or at least IgA2, which is the stuff that's secreted into um, the uh, lumen or the mucosa respiratory tract, is non inflammatory, which is important because you don't want a massive inflammation um, of I guess, cells in normal breathing because that would just be asthma and then you could never breathe again. Um, which is not good. So IgA monomers are found in serum. These are pro-inflammatory and they can bind to FC receptors, which is part of why they're pro-inflammatory. An IgA2 dimer is two, um, I guess, uh, antibodies um, connected by a J-chain and secret component. These um, are built there just because of how they sort of were made. But this secretory component um, I guess these can then bind to bacteria and pathogens and like that, and they will move on from there. But they won't activate an immune response because they don't have an ability to bind to FC receptors. So they are good at neutralizing antigens, for instance, toxins, um, but it's not inflammatory because it can't bind to FC receptors. And so therefore, it um, will not generate an immune response and won't cause blockages, but it also allows you to have a symbiotic relationship with the microbiome, allowing you to have um, that sort of level of, I guess, um, bacteria there, uh, commensal bacteria that allows you to have a stable system, basically. Um, the body doesn't totally ignore these commensal bacteria. It secretes IgA in small amounts instead of using a mass inflammatory response. So it helps in that regulatory process. These are just two diagrams showing the case in the same idea. This is kind of how IgA is produced, and this is kind of how IgA is sort of used um, in the body. So immunopathology is a surgery system. So different arms of the respiratory um, immune system well, different arms of the immune system are responsible for different pathogens, so a deficit in a specific arm will cause a specific deficit in a response. So problems with B cells and TL help with 17 cells for bacterial infections, definitive AGA will cause an increase in cytopulmonary bacterial infections. The mucosal surfaces of the body are also all connected, so lymphocytic activation in one area will recirculate all the other sites as well. Um, allergic rhinitis and asthma, so these effectively are caused by mast cells in the lamina propria um, driven by an IgE response. So mast cells express FC receptors which IgE will bound and then the antigen will bind to that IgE and that will cause degranulation. And that will cause you have an immediate response from histamine, which is this sort of thing here. But it will also be a late response from the cytokine and leukotrienes which will last longer um, from an eosinophilic infiltrate. Um, these, I guess, the IgE is what drives response, and this comes from B cells, which themselves are driven by TL2 cells. These activate eosinophils via interleukin 5. Um, effectively, how important the idea is that this IgE from TL2 cells is what drives damage and drives the allergic process. And this is a, I guess, a five or different pathway to the TL1. Um, cells which inferior gamma has, which produces IgG instead. Because asthma is a result of this IgE response, there's a thickening of the basement membrane, increasing collagen and reduction in compliance. These are classic signs of asthma and are it's important to recognize. Um, and the idea is that IgE exists so that it can protect against like parasites and helminths using the weep and sweep response, which is basically what you see in analogies. So massive um, mucus production and you're like sneezing and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's good at trapping them, but it's also causing this immune um, allergy response. And the idea with new allergen immunotherapy is that the idea is that through continuous repeated exposure, we aim to try and get it away from this TLP2 IgE response and move it to the TLP1 to and gamma response, which decreases this sort of allergic response and decreases the allergic drive. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but does anyone have any questions about any of that? Um, we hope you guys have food and snacks and things.
because we're drained. <laughs> we're getting drained. <laughs> uh, so I can only imagine how well you guys are going. Um, we've got about an hour left. Yeah. Um, I reckon we can finish it quicker than that. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're on the home stretch now. Um, if you guys don't have any questions, we'll just keep going. Um, so we're basically just going through resp exam, resp history, um, and a few of the pathology conditions that are quite important in resp. Um, so we'll start off with examination and history. So there are a few things you need to ask about. So first one being cough, I think that's probably the most obvious one. Um, so when did it start? What kind of cough it is? Um, and how has it been progressing? It's associated with mainly a lot of the um, infectious conditions, um, but also like asthma, COPD is also one, smoking, um, or iatrogenic, so like medical, medication induced. Um, linked to cough is sputum, so you'd ask about whether they're producing any sputum, how much sputum they're producing, what color it is, and various colors are associated with various sort of things, so red is blood, yellow, green, or rust is generally a type of infection, um, and clear is kind of normal. Um, and then how is that associated with smell um, and frothiness? Um, again, hemoptysis, so you should always, even if they don't say they're coughing up blood, you should always ask up, do you ever cough up blood anyway? Um, just in case, um, it's kind of like a tick the box kind of thing, especially in your Oskis. Um, but yeah, asking how much blood they're coughing up, so whether it's a cup, whether it's a tablespoon, whether it's just specs, um, and how often that's happening, whether it's recurrent all the time um, or just intermittent. So like we were talking about before, we also have to ask about wheeze. So either just a normal wheeze or strider. So strider is high-pitched wheeze. It's more so inspiratory, whereas other wheezes are more so expiratory. Um, but also asking about hoarse voice. Has their voice changed associated with laryngitis? Um, and pain. So either chest pain. So that would be associated with some sort of like inflammatory condition. So like pleuritis or pleural effusion. Um, anything in the chest really can cause chest pain um, or facial pain. So whether it's like something like sinusitis um, and for that you do your standard WWQQAA. Um, and then shortness of breath. So that's another one. So do they feel like they're ever short of breath or breathless? Um, that's probably the way you would ask it. Um, and there's a few associated questions you ask for that. So whether it's happening only after exercise or whether it's sort of like a rest at rest shortness of breath, um, whether it's worse at night or not, or whether it's worse lying down. Um, and then you've got your systemic questions, which you'd ask at the end of pretty much any kind of history. So whether I've got fever, night sweats, malaise, um, and then you, those will usually be associated with either TB or cancer as your standard ones. Um, a few other ones, they're more so like ear, nose, and throat. Um, so not always in the standard RESP exam, um, but if you have time, you can go ahead and ask them. So about nosebleeds, sore throat, um, post-nasal drips. So that's like if um, they've got like buildup of mucus at the back of their throat, whether they're sneezing, whether they've got a runny nose or snoring, um, which is like sleep apnea. Uh, okay, and here's a mnemonic you can use. So this one I use, can someone help Freddie with doing a pulmonary history? So cough, sputum, hemoptysis, fevers and night sweats, wheezing and strider, dyspnea, pain, and then hoarseness of voice. Um, it's a little bit disheveled and not in the right order, but like they won't care. It's like second year Oscars. It's fine to do it in this kind of systematic way um, as long as you just run through all those questions you should be fine um, yeah okay so resp exam so i've kind of like written like a dialogue of exactly what you'd kind of need to say um, which is probably the easiest way to do it now and then you can sort of um, adjust it yourself um, so you introduce yourself do hand hygiene so whenever i do it i associate high and then press down on it with the, <laughs> the hand hygiene bottle and that it's always attached in my mind from now on um, so you'll never forget to do it if you do it like that. Attach it to some sort of action you do at the start. Um, talk about what a respiratory exam is. Um, so it's be looking, listening, feeling, touching, all that kind of thing and percussing. Um, and then talk about confidentiality. So you're bound by the same laws of confidentiality and then ask for exposure. It's always important to ask for exposure. Um, it's probably best to do it at the start of the exam rather than um, like while you're doing the middle of stuff, um, it's just easier at that time. And also, I guess on the general stuff of things like this, for now, it doesn't really matter for you guys too much, just because it's like, whatever. Um, but when you get close to the OSCEs, 
I'm actually happening. Learn to do this really quick. So like this stuff yeah. is like literally a checkbox. Like yeah. there's a box of have you did, did you do consent? Did you do confidentiality or whatever? So yeah. the faster you can get the, the, this stuff done, the more time you actually have to do an exam, which is kind of the more important, I guess, or the more mark heavy aspect of things. So on the flip side, like this can also be nice to develop rapport if you're like really, really friendly. Um, one of the things I did was just like ask, how are you? And they're so good. And that like is like rapport right there. Um, so that can also be a thing that you do, but like, who cares? Um, so then before you get started, you get their basic details, um, ask them to remove their shirt at that point. Um, and then ask them if there are any pain or discomfort before you start. Um, Cause that might alter what you need to do or how you're doing your things or what you report during your findings. Um, and tell them you can stop at any time. So general inspection, there's a few, a lot of these are kind of general things you do in any examination. So you start with like, are they in any general pain, discomfort or distress? Um, you note their body habitus, whether it's obese, overweight or cachectic. You don't say um, the patient is obese, you just say body habitus um, noted. Noted. <laughs> noted is probably the best word to say it. Um, so whether they're fatigued, whether they have altered mental state, whether they're short of breath, um, so whether they're using accessory muscles, so whether they're going like, like using their whole um, thorax muscles or pursing their lips to breathe and how they're breathing. So you know whether they're coughing, whether they have a hoarse voice, whether they're in respiratory distress or have a wheeze or anything at all. And always you should be looking around the room as well. So whether they have any inhalers, oxygen mask or sputum cups um, or oxygen tanks or anything like that, just associate with them. That can all help you with um, your eventual diagnosis at the very end. It's just important to take note of all that kind of stuff. Next, you'd say your vital signs, usually you won't be actually asked to perform this, um, but you should always mention it and they'll tell you to just move on. Um, but these are the things you'd be looking for. So pulse rate for 30 seconds, rest rate for a minute. Um, pulses paradoxus is a finding you can have in respiratory disease. So that's when, if you're taking the pulse and they're breathing in um, and, the, and the pulse disappears, that's pulses paradoxus. Um, and you'd also do pulse oximetry. So testing the oxygen saturation by putting the little clip on the end of the finger. Um, the oxygen sat machine, um, and then doing their blood pressure as well. You can also check for pulses paradoxes through their blood pressure machine, but it's just so much harder. Um, so you do it, it's just easier to do it through their pulse. Next, you move on. So after you've done your general inspection, after you've done vital signs, you move on to peripheral inspection. So starting with the hands, um, the way I think about it is like a three, one, three, one kind of um, method. So you start with the palmar side, you're looking for peripheral cy cyanosis. So whether fingers are blue, look at the pallor of the palmar creases so you get their fingers and you like stretch it out wide to check if the creases are white or red if they're white it's pallor um, and then you check their hyperthena and thena eminences because if you've got a tumor um, in the top of your lungs that will impinge upon your brachial plexus so it'll, like i think it's like t1 nerve roots um, and if your t1 nerve roots aren't working the muscles that it's innervating aren't working and so they'll waste away so that's your thena and hyperthena eminences um, Next, you move on to the dorsal aspect. I consider, it's not really dorsal, but I say it's dorsal, um, but it's just tar stain. So it'll be like black marks in between um, their fingers kind of thing. Um, usually it's between the index finger and third finger because that's usually where people smoke. That's where they keep their cigarette. Um, and then there's three tests you do. So there's resisted abduction. So again, um, checking for um, compression of the T1 root by the lung tumor. Um, you check for clubbing. So shamroth, checking for shamroth's window. So you put... They're two index fingers together and if you see a space in between them that's shamroth window it's present that means there's no clubbing um, but generally you can just see clubbing um, if you just look at their hands um, but you should do the test if you're in an actual oski the clubbing test um, and then asterixis so you hold out your hands directly in front of you straight ahead like that um, and then you cock your finger, hands back as far as possible um, and make sure your fingers are spread as wide you ask them to hold it for 30 seconds um, and if the hands begin to flap like flat, 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 um, that's asterixis. And it's a sign of sort of metabolic disease or you've got too much waste in your body. Um, and with respiratory conditions in particular, it's to do with CO2 retention. Um, you can also push back on the hands. So if it's out like this, you can like push back against it to try to like elicit the flap. Mm. And then wrist. So this is back to your three, one, three, one. So if you just feel around the wrist and they say it's painful, um, that's called hypertrophic pulmonary osteoarthropathy osteoarthropathy which osteoarthropathy um which is involved associated with cancer um yeah so once you finish with the wrist you can move up to the face 
Um, so you start by looking at the general face, so you see if it's red or not. Um, if it's red, it's SVC obstruction. Um, so it means that there's a lot of blood, so there's venous obstruction, so a lot of blood is just pulling in the face and that's why it looks so red. Um, alternatively, it's because of smoking or polycythemia, so you've got excess red blood cells. Um, next, you look for sinus tenderness, so you feel over the sinuses, so your frontal sinuses on your forehead, um, maxillary sinuses under your eyes, you just see if it's tender, if it's painful, uh, ask if it's painful, if it's painful then it's bad. Um, yeah. Then you can move on to your eyes, so you look again for your standard, this will be, you do through almost every examination, icterus and pallor. Um, so scleral icterus is an indicator of like liver disease, kind of jaundice usually, um, but it can be associated with like pretty much every other system in the body. Um, but you ask them to look down and you sort of raise their eyelids up and you check if it's yellow, if it's yellow it's scleral icterus. Um, then you ask them to look up and you pull down from their eyelids. Um, so if it's pale, if the um, conjunctiva don't look pink um, and they look white, that's indicative of anemia. Um, and then the third thing to look in the eyes is for Horner syndrome, which is a sort of this trio. It's ptosis, so a drooping eyelid, anhydrosis, a lack of sweat, um, and meiosis, which is dilation dilation of the pupils i always forget but it's dilation um, and that's to do with sympathetic chain damage it can be associated with cancer so again if you have cancers um they're impinging on the brachial plaque or oh, the stellate chain sorry which is the sympathetic chain um and that can affect all these sort of sympathetic responses um in the eyes okay Next, moving on to the nose, so deviated septum, you look with a light, you like fly in a, shine a torch, or you can shine your phone if you don't have a torch, but don't do that in the OSCE, get a torch, they'll have a torch with you. Um, but you check for deviation of the septum, which is sort of the middle thing in the nose. Um, if it's deviated, it's bad. Um, and then the other two nasal polyps and gorge turbinates, they're sort of just protrusions out from the nasal wall, um, and they're usually sort of like asthma or allergic conditions. Um, moving on to the mouth, you're looking for central cyanosis, Crowding of the oropharynx, red pharynx, and dentition. So you ask them to open their mouth up. You check their lips and tongue for any bluing. That will indicate there's a lack of oxygenation going to those lips and tongue. Um, you ask, look for crowding of the oropharynx. So you look at the back of the pharynx where um, the tonsils are. You see, if is there space there? Can you see like their throat? If you can see their um, the back of their throat, it's good. If you can't, then it's bad. It means there's Typically obesity. Yeah, right? obesity. Um, but it's also associated with like sleep apnea because um, they can't. They don't. Have, they have sort of a narrowing of that upper airways. Um, red pharynx and large tonsils, a sign of infection. Um, and poor dentition, it'll be a sign of kind of smoking um, or just poorly brushing your teeth. Um, ear, you look for ear infections in rest in the resp exam because um, the nasal canal and the upper pharynx is associated. There's a, I guess a canal that travels between the ear and the upper pharynx um, and so you can get infections spreading from there into the ear. Next you look at the neck so you do your cervical lymph nodes and maybe I'll do it on someone yeah. just because it's hard because there's a bunch of different cervical lymph nodes. Uh, yeah so maybe I'll, I'll sit behind it later. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so you, uh, you do it from behind and in front. Um, does it look fine? Or not? Usually. Does it look fine? usually sit at the same level as the not above yeah them. you'll sit at the same level but I'll for the purposes of today we're going to sit at the i'm going to sit above alina um but you basically use like a rolling motion um to feel the lymph nodes in various places so you start by under the chin and obviously do hand hygiene first but you start under the chin with the <laughs> submental lymph node um and then the submandibular is kind of like halfway along the jawline i like the angle of the jaw and then tonsillar is behind the angle um, and then preauricular, so in front of the ear where they have that little cartilage piece um, on the bone area, and then behind the ear is postauricular, and then superficial cervical. So you feel along sternocleidomastoid, which is one of your neck muscles. Um, so you kind of like hook it in with one hand, but only do it one at a time. So one hand at a time, one side at a time. The so sternocleidomastoid, superficial, superficial cervical on one side, and then superficial cervical on the other side. And then you ask them to turn. So I'll ask Alina to turn to her left, and then I'll do the deep cervical. So I'll hook my head, fingers into those sternocleidomastoids a bit deeper, and then I'll ask her to look to the right, and then I'll hook it in to sternocleidomastoid a bit deeper. And again, you don't want to obstruct their carotid arteries and make them faint, so that's why you're doing it like that. And then you do the posterior cervical, so along the anterior border of trapezius muscle, 
um, the traps. So oh. along your traps, basically, as long as you're somewhere in that region, they won't really care, and it's you can enough. improve it. You get it. Go on mm -hmm. supraclavicular. You feel kind of above their clavicles in that little um, valley above their clavicles, fossa, I guess you would call it. Um, you can ask them to raise their shoulders, but often this isn't actually help that much, um, according to clinical people. Um, but like, yeah. that's, <laughs> um, you can ask them to raise their shoulders in the actual exam. Um, to look like you know your stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can do your occipital lymph node. So that's um, at the back of the head. And again, I'll ask Elaine to turn. And you can feel there's a little occiput, um, which is like a bony production, and it's a little bit under there. Um, Just the base of the skull at the back. Yeah. Um, auxiliary lymph nodes, you should mention these, but you shouldn't actually perform them. And they're not actually cervical lymph nodes, actually. I need to delete that. But they're a different group of lymph nodes um, that should be performed, but should not be performed, but mentioned. Um, next you do Pemberton signs, so that's again looking for um, SVC obstruction, so you ask them to raise their hands above their head um, for 30 seconds and if their face either goes red or it's going blue um, or there's extended veins, it it's a bad sign, it's a sign of obstruction or something there that's stopping blood from flowing back. Okay, tracheal deviation, so you put your fingers on the trachea and you just see if they're med midline, um, they should be in between the clavicles. Um, you can also then perform tracheal tug after that. So you ask them to breathe in. Um, if the trachea moves downward, then it's an indicator of that's tracheal tug um, and it's an indicator of COPD. Um, so in COPD, you've got this hyperinflated chest. So it's all pulling the trachea down. It's hyperinflation pulling that trachea down. Um, when you're doing tracheas up as well, warm them at you about it, like touch the trachea because it's not comfortable whatsoever. Yeah, it's actually so it's quite like, uncomfortable to yeah. have like fingers in there. So. You have to warn them that it might be uncomfortable. Mm. Um, For good. <laughs> yeah, building patient rapport always be nice. Always give a. Always be talking through what you're doing. Um, yeah. Okay. Next, JVP. Um, I might not talk about this because we talked about this in the cardio exam, and I imagine you've done it. Um, but again, you get them to recline at 45 degrees. Look over their left shoulder and look for the JVP, that biphasic pulsation between the two heads of sternocleidomastoid. Um, and then you measure it. So if it's right. normal, oh, but then look left. Oh, okay. yeah. And then look on their right shoulder. Um, sorry. Um, and then measure from sternocleidomastoid with a ruler. If it's it's normal, if it's three or less, if it's three centimeters or less, it's bad. If it's above three centimeters, um, and then you can again perform the abdominal jugular reflex after that if you'd like. For the JVP, if you like can't see or anything like that, just like keep trying, like keep looking for JVPs. Like don't get disheartened by the fact like I can see nothing. Like this is just the neck and the skin. Don't mm -hmm. get too disheartened by that. Like the more you look at it, the more you practice it, the more you actually start seeing it. Mm -hmm. And like the first JVP you see, you're like, oh my god, I saw a JVP. And mm -hmm. then like you end up not seeing it the next time. But the more you see it, the better you become at it. So just, and like, sometimes keep... you really just can't see it. Like some mm -hmm. people don't have a bit visible JVP. Like if they're really dehydrated. Yeah. So. If you really can't see it, just say you can't see it. Yeah. They won't penalise you for it because you've looked for it. So. You, if you can't see it, mention that you'd like recline them further and further yeah. um, down to like get it to move up, but like they're not actually going to make you and do that. Say or what, say you'll come back to yeah. it later. Yeah. And say what you would do if you had seen it. So like yeah. you measure it from three centimeters or measure it with a ruler from the spur, so not much. Like that. And then the final sign, peripheral sign you'd be looking for is in the legs, so pitting edema of the ankles. That again is a sign of fluid overload and right heart failure. Okay, local inspections. This is when you get to the chest. So there's a few things you need to look for. Scars, swelling, rashes, and redness is a common thing. You can apply to pretty much every examination you're doing. Um, I always mention that at the start because it's something you can get over. It's always similar. And then certain deformities. So there's barrel chest, pigeon chest, funnel chest, and Harrison sulcus. Um, and again, you just measured, mentioned these. You, won't, you probably won't see them in your patients in the OSCE, but who knows what they actually have. Um, yeah. Um, so they're all just different types of chest deformities, asymmetry in breathing. So when you're looking at them breathing, a look if there's like one side that's moving higher than the other, or one part of their body that's moving differently to the other part of their body, whether there's accessory muscle use, intercostal indrawing. So whether, um, intercostals are coming in, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, a visible apex beat. So where you can see the pulsation of their heart just from looking, um, and prominent dilated veins, um, palpation. So this is when you're actually feeling them. So... The way I do it, maybe I'll do it on cab. Um, but you basically just feel sort of along the chest. I use both hands on both sides and ask them if there's yeah. any pain. It's like, get this on the actual shot. <laughs> Are you in there? 
Yeah, I think like like send a high. Yeah. So like yeah. Just, okay. So you just feel on both sides, one one hand on the back of their chest, one hand on the front of their chest, and just asking for any pains. So this is like looking for like fractures and stuff like that. Um, but you can also be checking for if there's any crackling under the skin. So if you feel crackling, that's subcutaneous emphysema. So it means it's like air trapped in that skin. Um, you also check for the apex beat. So you palpate along um, the midclavicular line, looking for the, uh, I guess the sternum, looking for the fifth intercostal space, and then you go to the midclavicular line. Um, and it may do display some certain lung diseases, um, which are listed here, um, and we'll talk about later. Chest expansion. So this is looking about testing for hyperinflation or overexpansion of the chest or um, poor inspiration. Um, so you do this from both the front and the back. So Kevin, can you expire fully? Yep, so you ask them to expire fully. Grab your fingers onto their, um, onto their ribs um, with your thumbs touching in the middle and then ask them to inspire fully. Yep, and so your fingers should move apart. Um, and if it's greater than five centimeters, then it's good. Uh, if it's less than five centimeters, then that's bad. It means there's um, abnormal movement um, and then you'll do that from the front so if you're doing you do the same thing from the front ask them to expire fully put your fingers there really hook them in um, really hook them in your fingers except for your thumb your thumb should sort of be lightly over their um, body and touching um, and if you see it on the front if you see that they're actually there's an inward movement during inspiration that's called Hoover's sign and it's um, sort of a characteristic sign in COPD yeah, so next is vocal fremitus. So you put your hands on their chest and you ask them to say 99. 99. And if you feel vibration, that's really good because there's air there that's vibrating through. There's no sort of dullness, um, nothing stopping the vibration, no masses or anything like that. Okay, percussion. So percussion's really hard, um, especially if we're not in person to show you percussion. Um, but basically, um, you keep your non-dominant hand on a surface. You put it firmly. Uh, you put it firmly on a surface like that. Say if there's a flat table on chest. there. Yep, Kevin can be my <laughs> surface. Um, and then in the sort of middle part of your finger, there's, your finger is composed of three parts. On the middle part of your finger, keeping a solid finger on the side, just tap. Um, and you're trying to tap from the wrist pretty much and try and get a percussive noise. Um, and that's the whole idea of percussion. That's the whole technique behind percussion. Um, and you use percussion to check the resonance. So check what kind of um, densities are in the thorax. So if it's normal, it's air. If it's hyper-resonant, it means there's lots of air. So it's like pneumothorax, too much air in your lungs. If it's dull, it means there's sort of a mass there. And if it's stony dull, it's associated with pleural effusion, which is like a fluid in your pleura. Um, and now I'll demonstrate on Kevin. Um, <laughs> um, percussion. Um, so... Wait, we'll just check that he's positioned. Yeah, we'll just... Yeah. Camera. So just sit there. Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay. So well, the important thing about percussion is that you're always comparing between each side um, because that's what you're trying to do. You're comparing um, each part of the lung with each other to check what's normal. So for each location, I'm going to percuss on one side. Make sure you're percussing in between. So ask them to put their hands on their shoulders for the back so you get um, their scapulas moving forward and you're clearing up that lung space and tap percuss in between the vertebra and the scapula. So you percuss on one side and then the same location on the other side and you slowly move down their chest. There's a diagram on the slides which shows exactly where you need to percuss and then you do it on the edges uh, and you're constantly comparing and checking if the sound's the same. Um, and then you do the same on the front and the same um, on the sides. So you ask them to raise their arms for the sides um, and you can just keep it by their sides for the front, um, for the anterior chest wall. Um, yeah. Also, there's not really like a set number of locations you have to do. Like some people will do like 10 on the front and then 10 on the back. But really, like you can just do six, like keep it brief for the Oscars because you're timed. As mm -hmm. long as you're doing left, right, left, right, and then going down, you're, pre you're pretty much going to cover it. So it's yeah. good enough for Oscars. Okay. I usually do three anteriorly, three posteriorly, so three each side. And then two laterally. Yeah. On and then the um, anterior side as well, when you percuss over yeah, the top, you percuss over the clavicles, not over the hands. So with the clavicles, you're not putting a finger down. You're just using one finger and just tapping on the clavicle pretty much. Um, yeah, I do four in the front, four in the back, and then two on the sides. But again, it's Doesn't variable matter. between people. Okay. Auscultation. So this is when you're using your stethoscope. 
Yeah. Maybe I'll get the stethoscope. The stethoscope. <laughs> <laughs> um, so things to make sure when you're doing using the stethoscope, make sure you clean the stethoscope before you use it. We don't have hand sanitizer, but that's okay. Because Kevin's a healthy, non immunocompromised <laughs> person. Um, so clean your stethoscope. Make sure it's adjusted to the right side. Um, so using the bell for above the clavicles um, and the diaphragm, which is the big side, for below the clavicles. Um, make sure when you put it on, you've got the earpieces facing, like, forward. angling forward. Um, yeah. And so what you're going to do, you ask the patient, just slowly breathe in and out, um, and you move the stethoscope. Um, based on their breath. So you don't tell them, breathe in now, breathe out then, breathe in now, breathe out now. Um, you just ask them to breathe out in and out slowly and normally, and then you accommodate for their breathing. So what you do, you put your stethoscope in. Taking um, like deep breath also helps. So like yeah. Take deep, breaths. deep, slow breaths is, yeah. I think, what I say sometimes. Um, and again, you're doing the same thing. You're comparing both sides of the thorax. Um, so Kevin, can you take some deep breaths in and out? Yeah, so I'll put my stethoscope there. And you just do the same locations that you just percussed over. Yeah, and then once he's, when he's expiring, that's when I'm moving my stethoscope because I want to hear when he's taking the inspiratory breath. I don't really care about his expiration. Yeah, and then you do that same thing. And remember that the lungs end quite far down, mm. um, like Alina mentioned before. Are you really? Yep. <laughs> yeah. And so you do the same thing in the same locations as you do with yeah. percussion. Um, and there's three types of breath sounds you can hear. So there's a normal vesicular breath sound, so low pitched, soft and longer on inspiration than expiration. Abnormal is bronchial. I just remember it because it's like B, B for abnormal and B for bronchial. Um, high pitched and lower on expiration, longer on expiration than inspiration. And then there's, there's your adventitious breath sounds. So your, um, extraneous kind of breath sounds, so either crackles, wheezes, or plural rubs. Um, so these are the three ways you categorize it. Um, and you can compare it to listening over the trachea. So um, I didn't do this in my OSCE, but some people did, I think. Um, you put your stethoscope over the trachea, um, ask them to breathe in. And that would be bronchial breath sounds. So those are what your abnormal breath sounds would sound like. I think you don't really ever do that in an exam. It's more so just have an idea of yeah. what bronchial breath sounds would smell, sound like. So you can down look, and listen to it over the trachea, and that's kind of what you're listening for. Um, you don't really do that in an exam. Because... You can also just like look it up on YouTube. There's lots of like recordings of what they sound like, so you can mm. familiarize yourself with them. Yep, and so the next things you do are vocal resonance and whispering pectoriloquy, which takes so long. Um, <laughs> but you ask them to say 99 basically while you're doing exactly the same thing. Um, so each in, in each location you ask them say 99 and you listen to whether it's um, clearly audible or not clearly audible. Um, it's usually pretty fuzzy, but it's clearly audible in consolidated lung. And then likewise with whispering pectoriloquy, instead of saying 99, they whisper 99. Um, and that's just a little more sensitive, I think, in certain conditions. Um, but again, you won't probably have time to do this in your OSCE, and neither expected to. I remember my ClinSkills tutor, I think she was the head of ClinSkills, she'd always say, you're not expected to do a full RESP exam in eight minutes, we'll make it easy for you, um, we'll do what's possible. Um, in third year, not so much, but uh, yeah. <laughs> and whisper and whispering we test the same thing. So like, oftentimes, if you just do one of them, there's really only one criteria mm. in the OSCE like, examination. Yeah, okay. So that brings us to the end of the respiratory exam. Here's again the diagram showing where you should be or a guide to where you might be wanting to do your auscultation and percussion, um, but again, not super strict. Okay, and then you t you give your little spiel at the end. This brings us to the end of the examination. All the findings today were normal, assuming they are normal. Do you have any questions? No, hopefully no. Thank you for your time. And always offer to help them um, if they need to put back on their shirt or their garments. Um, it just makes your rapport look a lot better. Um, and perform hand hygiene at the end. Make sure you always perform hand hygiene. Just a quick note, if the findings were abnormal, this is more relevant for like exams where they can like fake it easier. But if they actually were abnormal, do say they were abnormal. Because in our OSCEs, like we're doing an eye exam, so they're kind of different. But the visual acuity was like actually abnormal and you were actually supposed to like say it was abnormal. I usually um, just say I'm going to discuss the findings with your yeah. GP, something mm. like that, so it's vague, yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, so that brings us to the end of the respiratory examination. Um, try practicing them early. Don't try and cram them at the end because it's very difficult to cram them at the end. And it's possible to fail sometimes. <laughs>
Um, so yeah, put in some effort at the start. Um, practice with some friends if you have friends. Um, <laughs> if you're allowed to leave the house. Um, or practice on a pillow, you know. Whatever yeah, you do. whatever you have to do to get <laughs> get some practice. All right. So the next part, a next another part of OSCEs is about asthma explanation. So explaining to someone. Maybe they've been recently diagnosed with asthma or they want to learn more about asthma. Um, and there's a few things you should do at the start. So you introduce yourself, um, get all the introductory details, and then you start off on your spiel. So you ask them, always ask them, what do you want? To, what do you know about asthma to begin with? And what would you like to know about asthma? It sort of makes it seem a bit more patient-centered um, and as you care a bit more about what their lives are like um, and what they want to know. But it's always just good to frame it that way. Um, to begin with, so you're not just rambling on about stuff maybe they already know about. Um, so again, this is how I did it. So definition, epi, signs and symptoms. So what is asthma? It's an inflammatory condition where the airways are inflamed and narrow and it makes it hard to breathe. Always try and keep the jargon to as minimal as possible um, whenever you're doing explanation stations. Um, so what's asthma? It's a long-term condition, can't be, con can't be cured, but it can be controlled very, very well. Um, about 1 in 10 people have asthma. It's more common in childhood, but affects all people of all ages. So it's a universal kind of illness, um, but it's just more common in childhood. Some of the major signs and symptoms, these are probably the big four in asthma. So breathlessness, wheezing, most particularly on expiration, tightness in the chest and a continuing cough. And then you'll talk about your pathophys. So people, you often talk about the pathophys in comparison um, by using an example like a balloon or a tree trunk. So saying, your lung is like a balloon um, and it's difficult to, like your lungs are like a balloon and when you have asthma, it's difficult for the balloon to inflate. So it makes it harder for it to breathe. Um, and maybe, yeah, exactly. That's pretty much it. Um, but yeah, this is kind of more so the other side of the path of fizz. So thin layer of muscle, they become inflamed and so the areas become narrow and tight. That makes it hard to breathe. They can also get swollen, which also makes it narrow. That makes it hard to breathe. You can get mucus production, which blocks the airways. That makes it hard to breathe. Um, everything just makes it harder to breathe, pretty much. Um, oh, also, if anyone's confused as to why we're doing this, so your OSCEs at the end of the year, they can be examination-based, so you do an exam. They can be history-based, so you mm. take a history. Or they can be explanation, which is where you have to explain like a condition or a treatment to a patient. So that's what this Or like is a about. procedure. Yeah. yeah. Or you can get a procedure slash investigation, like a chest x-ray. Yeah. But this is for like an explanation station if you're asked to explain how asthma works to someone. Yeah. So it's pretty relevant. Um, asthma especially is kind of like a big one they like to do. Um, it's probably the most accessible explanation station, I would say. So try and learn and it fairly well. COCP. Yeah. And in addition to the oral contraceptive pill, which we'll do later, um, these are one of the big two ones. Um, so then you'd move on to your etiology and triggers. So we don't actually know what causes asthma exactly, um, but we know it's linked. There's a genetic link to it. So if you have a family history of asthma, um, and there's also the environmental links to it. So um, there's triggers such as smoking, colds and flu, allergies, pollen, or exercise. Diagnosis, the way we do it is through spir spirometry, and we see if there's sort of this um, reduced obstructive disease um, before and after the use of certain medications we call bronchodilators. Um, how do we manage it? So every adult and child with asthma, asthma has their own personalized written action plan um, and that states exactly what they should be doing um, to manage the asthma. It's pretty individual to everyone. It's often done by general practitioners in the community. Um, but there's sort of two fundamental aspects it's um, built on. So after avoiding your triggers and after avoiding um, and self-education pretty much on asthma, um, there's two medications it's built on, which is preventers and relievers. So preventers you use when you have an acute asthma attack. Um, relievers, oh sorry, relievers you use when you have an acute asthma attack. Preventers you should use sort of every day um, as a long-term sort of chronic management in order to stop you getting your asthma attacks. And it's sort of like a prophylactic kind of thing. Um, and then the side effects of them. So preventers um, they can sort of have these sympathetic effects so you get your increased heart rate um, shaky hands anxiety um, they're generally not that bad um, and your relievers oh they're swapped around actually I think yeah. um, relievers I'll fix that after um, but relievers have corticosteroids preventers have corticosteroids in them and that's why they can cause these fungal throat infections um, or the hoarseness of 
voice. Um, because if you're suppressing that immune response, you can get sort of opportunistic infections like candida. Um, and then, so your, your relievers are your um, sympathetic um, sort of drugs. That's why you get your increased heart rate, shaky hands and anxiety. Um, I'll change the slides after when we post them. Okay, um, and there's a certain ways we do each of our um, treatment for asthma. So this is when we're using our inhalers. Um, there's a couple of different types of inhalers, um, but they're all kind of similar. Um, you have to check expiry dates, you take the cap off, make sure you're shaking the inhaler. It's important to breathe out completely before using your inhaler. You tilt your head back, put form a tight seal with your mouth around the mouthpiece, but make sure you're not putting your lips on it. Um, because that can interfere with the medication and whether it's going directly into your lungs um, um, or touching your tongue. Um, you press the button, slow deep breath for 10 seconds um, and then take it out and breathe slowly away. Wait one minute and repeat. Um, and then the repetitions are individualized according to the asthma management plans. So it could be um, four times um, and four sets of that. Um, so four by four, um, it could be something completely different. It depends on the acute management. Um, the other important aspect is to know the dried powered inhaler is very similar to the aerosol inhaler. Um, it's pretty similar, so I won't run through it, but the spacer is a little bit different. So a spacer is like um, a big sort of tube you attach onto the end of your asthma inhaler, and it's sort of a um, intermediary between the inhaler, you, and you. Um, so you put it between you and the inhaler. Um, and basically you pump the medication into the um, spacer, and then you can just breathe in and out of that space. So you don't need to coordinate it as effectively. You don't need to be as coordinated with your breathing and precise with the timings of the medication. Um, and so, yeah, the advantage is that you don't need to coordinate your breathing and, it'll, and it helps you get more medication into your lungs um, because the aerosol inhaler can be pretty hard for people. Um, it's hard even for us to like understand the mechanics of inhalers. Um, but there are a few side effects to also be noted of. Um, so you need to wash it with warm soapy water and air dry it. But if you if you dry it with like a cloth or something like that, you can build up static on the top of the space, on top of the spacer, and that can um, alter the eff efficacy and interfere with sort of medications. Because imagine if there's electricity, it does something to the medication, sticks to the sides, it's not all going into your lungs. Um, so that's sort of the main point to note about spacers. Um, we generally use them in children, but they're slowly, slowly moving into um, more adult use now as well um, with preventers. Um, and then tell them where they can get more information. So either you might have a pamphlet in front of you in that OSCE station, um, and you can show them exactly what they need to do. Some people make up and have a piece of paper with them and say, here's a piece of paper and like pretend all that kind of stuff. But I don't think that's a good idea because it just looks stupid. Um, but just recommend them to like a website. So say like asthmafoundation.com. I'm sure the examiners, they probably won't know the exact URL. So you can just say asthmafoundation.com. But a website's always a good way to do it. And you can tell them they can look at it when they go home. Um, and here are just some chip tips to get you through that explanation. So <laughs> give that information in chunks. So after you've maybe said one section, ask them to like repeat it back to you um, to check out their understanding. And if they haven't fully um, understood it. If it's not clear, just reinforce certain details. If it's if they're obviously not saying the right thing, don't use medical jargon. Don't speak too fast. Use rapport. Be nice. Be friendly. Um, and try and practice with the actual devices if you can. Um, when you if you ever get to clean skills, um, try and get your hands on a device and see what it actually does because it can be really helpful to see it in person if you've never had asthma or something like that. And it can feel really patronizing to ask them to like repeat it back to you, but there are actually marks for that. So mm. you have to ask them like, can you explain to me again how you would use the puffer or something like that? Yeah, the way you just explained it. The way I say it is like, oh, just to make sure we're on the same page, can you just repeat back to me what we've been talking about? Which again is still patronizing, but like a little yeah. better. <laughs> okay. Next explanation. So this is a peak flow meter. So this is um, a device used to assess airway obstruction, um, generally used to assess the severity of asthma instead of diagnosing asthma, um, varies with age, sex and height. And again, um, the way that I explain it is sort of it's like a bird whistle um, and you blow as hard as you can on that bird whistle basically. Um, so you move the marker to the bottom of the scale. When you have a bottom of the scale, you'll, <laughs> you'll realize um, what it looks like, but maybe look up a picture online. You stand up straight, make sure you're not leaning forward or coughing. Take a deep breath in um, and hold the breath away from that device. Then place your mouth mouth on the mouthpiece. Don't put your tongue on it. 
try and make a tight seal as hard as as best as you can blow it as hard and fast as possible so it's important to that it's as fast as possible it's not really um, about a long-term sort of measurement it's about that instantaneous forced expiratory volume um, that you're trying to get and then you get your measurement and you record this three times and the best of the three attempts will be the one you use is your peak flow number um, and this value is compared to a chart that we can see here um, and that chart is based on age sex and height um, there's a few things to be considering the, you must be standing up straight or must be sitting erect if they can't do that you can't lean forward you can't put your tongue on the mouthpiece um, and you have to do it in sort of like a quick motion it's not about a prolonged motion um, but again once you see the peak flow meter it'll make a bit more sense you also never have to like remember this graph this graph is like if they, they care they'll give it to you yeah it's just um, explaining that it's compared to age sex and height pretty much and this is how they do it okay chest x-ray interpretation so this is another type of station they might have um, they might put an x-ray in front of you and say um, interpret this x-ray and report your findings um, it's fairly uncommon I don't know if it's come up in a very long time um, but it's still one of the things they like to do um, so it's good to train for it so you start with your basic information you say who the patient is, what their ID is, the gender, the date the x-ray was taken, and that it is a chest x-ray. A lot of people don't say it's a chest x-ray, um, but say it's a chest x-ray because there's marks for that. Next is looking at the quality. So the way I do it is ripe. It's similar to your tuberculosis ripe, so you don't need to remember more than one mnemonic. Um, but yeah, so you start with rotation. So whether the actual thorax is rotated or not. So you check that by saying it's central if the spinous processes and the trachea are midline between the clavicles. That means they're not rotated. If not, it's malrotated. Inspired. So X-ray should or chest X-ray should be taken on inspiration. In order to assess for adequate inspiration, you should be looking for where the ribs are. So um, where the in ribs intersect with the diaphragm. So anterior ribs should intersect with the diaphragm at the midclavicular line, either at the fifth, sixth, or seventh rib. And the posterior ribs should intersect with the midclavicular line at the eighth, ninth, or tenth rib. Um, and we'll see that on a picture. We'll go through this all after with a normal x-ray. Um, yeah. Next is looking at position. So whether it's an anterior to posterior x-ray or posterior to anterior x-ray, lateral, decubitus, lordotic, all the other ones are not as frequent. Generally, it'll be AP or PA. Um, exposure, whether there's adequate penetration. So this is what to do with the actual radiograph, radio, radiographer's abilities and how they're doing it. So there's under penetration and over penetration, just like in photos, or there's adequate penetration if the vertebrae are just visible. Next, we're doing our A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H of um, x-ray. So we start with A, so looking at the airway. So we're looking for any tracheal deviations, any masses, um, any abnormal structures, and then the left hilum is higher than the right hilum. After that, we're looking at bone and soft tissue. So looking for any fractures in the bones, any subcut emphysema, or any soft tissue abnormalities. Next is cardiac structure. So we're looking for size of the car size of the heart. So it should be either half half the size or less of the cardiothoracic ratio, which is basically just the diameter from one side of the chest to the other side of the chest, um, from right to left, I guess. Um, and the outline of the heart should be pretty clear, a which is called your cardiac silhouette. Um, and there should be no retrocardiac density, so no unusual whitenings behind the heart. Next, we look at our D, so our diaphragm. The right diaphragm should be one to three centimeters higher. We should see costophrenic and cardiophrenic angles um, sharply. So costophrenic is when the diaphragm meets the ribs, so on the edges, so there should be a sharp angle there, and there should be cardiophrenic angles when the heart meets the diaphragm. Um, if there's air under the diaphragm, it's abnormal, except for what we call a gastric bubble, which we'll talk about after. Um, yeah. Next, we're looking for effusion. Um, a fusion looking for whether there's blunting of those angles um, or whether there's abnormal fluid levels in the lungs um, lung fields looking for whether there's consolidation collapse opacities pneumothorax pleural effusions gastric bubble what we talked about before it's sort of this bubble in the stomach um, which we see under the diaphragm which is normal headward is looking at for thymus and lymph nodes and then instrumentation is all these abnormal sort of um, foreign structures so whether it's tubes in and out a pacemaker or ecg leads um, and after that, once you've done that, you summarize what was normal and abnormal about the x-ray um, and you may choose to make a diagnosis at that point. Um, you should make a diagnosis at that point if it's abnormal um, and you suspect something. Okay, so we can look at the x-ray here. So again, we're looking for, run through that really quickly. So we're looking for age, date, all the identifying details, 
Um, next we look for ripe, so we're looking for rotation. The trachea is in the middle, midline, inspiration. So we're looking at the posterior ribs first. I find it easy to see the posterior ribs. So I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, nine. So I'm looking for, it's around about nine, I would say, or 10 maybe, um, intersection of the midclavicular line with the ribs, um, which is good. It's adequate inspiration. Um, P for pos position, so AP or PA. Um, so this is either AP or PA. It's quite difficult to say, um, but usually it'll be PA. Um, and note that it's only, you can only make a comment on um, cardiomegaly when it's in a PA x-ray. In AP, the heart always looks a bit enlarged. Um, and so it's difficult <laughs> um, to make a comment on cardiomegaly. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, after we've done airways, we look at bone and subcar tissue. I didn't see any fractures. So you're looking for any fraction in the middle of the ribs or any um, abnormal sort of opacities in the, uh, in the soft tissue or any subcutaneous emphysema. Um, yeah. Yeah. Next, we're looking at the heart. So the size of the heart is normal, um, normal cardiothoracic ratio, um, so no cardiomegaly, um, and it's on the left side of the body, um, so no decitis inversa dextrocardia. Um, good. So diaphragm, diaphragm on the right is higher. I don't see any abnormal air structures under the diaphragm. Um, good. Effusion, um, I don't see any pleural effusion, I don't see any blunting of the costophrenic angles or the cardiophrenic angles. Um, lung fields, I don't see any abnormal opacities. I don't see any consolidations. I don't see any um, effusions. I don't see any pneumothorax or anything like that. Um, G, I'm looking for the gastric bubble. I can see that clearly here. Um, under the diaphragm, um, H, I'm looking for headwood structures. So I don't see any abnormal lymph nodes. I can't even see a thymus. Thymus is so hard to see. But I don't see a th thymus looks normal. Um, yeah, and then instrumentation. So I don't see any pacemaker leads, ECGs, or wires, um, or any intravenous catheters. Sorry, not catheters. Catheters. Um, okay, next is rest pass. So we're just going to be running through the major kind of respiratory pathology. Um, we're getting late, and I understand everyone's getting tired. So we're going to be looking at buzzwords. Um, you don't need to know too much more than buzzwords for rest path. Um, yeah. Okay, so we'll start with COPD, progressive and irreversible obstruction of airways. The two main things to note is that it's made of chronic bronchitis and emphysema. So chronic bronchitis is like productive cough, it's due to airway narrowing. Emphysema is about dilation and obstruction of air spaces, so alveoli are physically collapsing. Um, so COPD stands for chronic obstruction. Obstructive pulmonary disorder. Yeah, sorry. I probably should have written that actually. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's made up of those two things. Generally, like that's the way we think about it, but like people are generally on a spectrum from chronic bronchitis to emphysema. It's definitely a spectrum. Um, epi doesn't matter, but it's just males, generally smokers or ex-smokers, and then older people. Um, there's a few different etiologies. So smoking is the big cause. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you don't need to know how it causes it, but it causes um, that emphysema or inflammation. Um, so you get this buildup of inflama inflammatory toxins generally, like in smoking or in an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, um, at least a ciliary dysfunction, that inflama inflammatory process, um, which leads to luminal narrowing and increased airway resistance, which makes it harder for you to breathe. So that obstructive airway disease. Pathophys, it's all about um, airway changes due to inflammation, pretty much. Um, main things are narrowing of airways, goblet cell hypertrophy, um, you can, because you're getting um, narrowing of the airways, your arteries constrict um, because your because in order to do that perfusion matching, perfusion ventilation matching, and because your pulmonary vessels are constricting, you get increased pressure in the pulmonary vessels, which can lead to pulmonary hypertension. Um, it's important to know the difference between inflammatory media. So in asthma, there's eosinophils in COPD, no eosinophils. That's probably the big difference to be aware of. You can read through this. Um, at home, I think I think it's I wrote it pretty well. Um, <laughs> I think it's fairly step by step and logical. Uh, but again, you don't actually need to know that much detail about all these conditions. It's all about the buzzwords um, at your level.
Um, and this hypoxia is like a key fair characteristic, um, a key result, a consequence of all those inflammatory processes. Risk factors, smoking, age, and genetic factors, which is alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Presentation. So the most important thing is a chronic cough with progressing shortness of breath, um, and you've got clear sputum in them. Um, a lot of COPD people have um, chronic pulmonary infections as well. They're smokers, um, and these are the signs you're looking for. They were also mentioned in the examination findings, so we won't talk about them again. Um, but yeah, Hoover sign, tracheal tug, and hyperinflation are generally a big characteristic ones. And hyperinflation is associated with a lower and flattened diaphragm. Um, like we were talking about before, there was that chronic difference between chronic bronchitis and, pink, and emphysema. So yeah, chronic bronchitis people are your blue bloaters, pink puffers are emphysema. Um, so I think the main thing to notice are pink puffers are compensating. So they're hyperventilating so much that they're um, working really, really hard and they're maintaining their um, oxygenation. Um, they've actually got normal oxygen levels, but because they're working so hard to maintain it, in blue bloaters, they've got that chronic hypoxemia um, and they're not able to maintain that sort of um, level of oxygenation. So there's like this slowly declining respiratory failure um, that you see. Yeah, I think that's the main sort of things to note. Um, yeah, pink puffers hyperventilate and are working really hard. Blue boaters, they're not. They just suck. Um, COPD investigation. So you, the main investigation is spirometry. The diagnostic inve investigation is spirometry. So if they've got an FEV, irreversible FEV, 1 over FVC ratio of below 70 um, is COPD. If you can't change that with bronchodilators, um, COPD, um, you might find hyperinflation on examination management smoking cessation um, oxygen therapy if they've got low oxygen you need to replace the oxygen because otherwise they're going to die probably sooner um, and then you give them bronchodilators to open up their airways and same with corticosteroids bronco to open up their airways um, and get increase the oxygenation complications pneumothorax if they're emphysema alveoli rupture core pulmonary which is pulmonary hypertension kind of um, because as we talked about before, low oxygenation and then polycythemia because they need more red blood cells to compensate for that low oxygenation. Pneumothorax. So this is when you get air in the pleural cavity um, causing partial or complete collapse. Um, either your parietal visceral pleura can tear and there's, um, air comes in from one side or the other and accumulates in the pleura. Um, pleural space. Tenlin, most commonly in younger males, um, uh, or after traumatic chest injuries, there's a few ways we classify it. So primary, secondary, traumatic. Primary is just no reason. We can't identify a reason. Secondary, there's an underlying lung disease or traumatic, like we hit them or something, um, or they got stabbed. Um, risk factors, the main ones to note, tall and slim, young, um, and Marfan syndrome. I think I forgot to put it in, but I'll add it in later again. Um, Marfan syndrome is like the big kind of buzzword. Um, and then presentation is that sharp, um, onset of chest pain in like a young person. Um, tracheal deviation, um, intention pneumothorax will get tracheal deviation because if you get, imagine there's like a lot of air in the pleura, that side of the lung pushes the trachea towards the other side of the lung. Um, and you can also displace the apex and mediastinum for similar reasons. Um, you get hyperresonance because there's too much air in that area um, and you get decreased breath sounds because they're not breathing as much. Um, you diagnose it with a chest x-ray, that's how you do it, easy. Um, and this is a pneumothorax. Collapsed lung, you can see over here. That's the lung right there. It should normally be attached um, or inflated, but it's not. So, or seen attached to the thoracic wall. Okay, management, um, you have to remove the air from the pleural space and you do that through thorac... thorac oh, I'm not gonna say it, don't worry. Just removal of air um, from the... <laughs> Um, plural space is how you do it. Um, and there's a few guidelines um, as to how you do it. And hyperbaric oxygen therapy is contraindicated. Um, you don't want to be giving them more oxygen at that point. Um, and this will come up. This is like a buzzword in a quiz somewhere um, in one of your quizzes. Okay. Um, and this is an indication for where you do your chair. Thorac, thorac, thorac. Whatever it is. Thoracostomy. Yeah, thoracostomy. Um, tension pneumothorax, special type of pneumothorax. So it's when there's air going in, um, but the air is unable to leave. So the way they say it is a one-way valve where air is only going one way um, and leads to accumulation. And that's what causes that tension pneumothorax. Um, transpulmonary pressure is really low in these ones, in these patients. Um, 
key thing to note. Um, go back to Kevin's diagram that we looked at before. Um, same sort of ideologies, um, generally more traumatic though. Um, management, same sort of decompression. Um, complications, you can get obstruction of venous return and vessels. Um, it's important to know different kinds of tracheal deviation, what causes different kinds of tracheal deviation. So if you got deviation towards one side of the lung lesion, it's generally in like fibrosis or um, something pulling the lung. So fibrosis tissue, it makes the lung get small and like pulls things towards it. So that's why it deviates towards lung lesion. Um, when there's deviation toward, from the, away from the lung lesion, that's when there's like something pushing it away. So like air, fluids or a mass, um, and then tension pneumothorax like causes that um, causes that deviation away. Um, it's important to note in spontaneous pneumothoraxes, there's generally normal, no deviation of the trachea. Um, it's generally a cure um, to do with net tension pneumothoraxes. Asthma. So inflammatory disorder, um, as opposed to COPD, it's reversible bronchial spasm and airway obstruction. Um, Kevin talked a lot a little bit before, but there's genetic factors and environmental factors. Um, so we'll talk about that after. Um, you've got your Th1 and Th2 responses that Kevin talked about before. Um, it's important to note that like when Th1 is strong in one person, Th2 is really weak. When Th2 is strong in one person, their Th1 responses are really weak. So in people who are more predisposed to asthma, they generally have high levels of Th2 cells um, and Th2 cells like make that sort of overreaction to um, certain um, allergens and that's what leads to sort of asthma um, you've got that overreaction because of your high th2 response um, and the pathophys behind it is like inflammation and remodeling um, you get fibrosis you get increased smooth muscle mass so that um, hypertrophy um, uh, hypertrophy um, you, because you've got this increased bulk the muscles are like sort of more um, sensitive to different allergens and so they're more likely to constrict and cause bronchospasm and they're more likely to contract and narrow um, and that's what leads to this sort of airway obstruction. You also get goblet cell like hyperplasia and that leads to excessive mucus. Um, and that also leads to airway obstruction. There's four stages in pathogens, induction, inflammation, airway remodeling, and then constriction. So what we just talked about. Um, yeah, and then there's a few mediators of this constriction. So it's important to note like histamines, leukotrienes, and acetylcholine are the main mediators of their constriction. We give them sympathetics to, in order to relax this um, when we're treating them. Okay, so there's tri various triggers, there's environmental triggers, diet, drugs, cold air, exercise, various sorts of things. Um, but the important presentation to know is there's sort of those four key characteristics, there's dyspnea, chest tightness, expiratory wheeze, and non-productive cough. Um, yeah, they might have a history of atopy, so it's important to note um, like eczema, hay fever, which is allergic rhinitis, um, and asthma all kind of go together. They're all associated with each other. Um, yeah. Oh, and then nasal polyps from Harris and Salk, it's not that important. Investigations and diagnosis. So the main way you diagnose it is by your spirometry, so your pulmonary function test. Your peak expiratory flow rate is more for, so for assessing severity, as we talked about before. Um, but if you're positive for asthma, if you've got an FEV over FEV, FEV1 over FVC below 80%, and if you give them bronchodilators, if there's a 200 mil increase or a more than 12% increase in that, um, then that's asthma, that's, they've got asthma. Um, asthma management plan, there's um, a few conservative things you can do, there's non-pharmacological things you can do, um, and then there's pharmacological things you can do, so you can trigger controls, avoid those triggers, or just give them sort of medications. Um, so the two medications we give them, do you wanna talk about this or do you wanna do this? Okay, I'll just go through them really quickly <laughs> because, yeah, we're getting to seven o'clock and everyone wants to go home. Um, <laughs> So there's your SABAs, your SAMAs, your ICS, LABAs, and LAMAs. So SABA stands for short acting, oh, it's written there. Um, you can read it. So it's basically give them those beta agonists to make them bronchodilate, make their airways expand. Um, and those are your releases. You give them immediately in the acute phase. Your preventers, you give them in the long term. So your corticosteroids and your long acting beta agonists or your long acting muscarinic antagonists. Um, and so the important thing to note is the stepwise treatment. So you start with SABAs as needed. You add a SABA with an ICS, so your inhaled corticosteroid. Then you add your LABA on, so SABA as your reliever and then your ICS LABA combo preventer. Um, and these are common combo preventers. Then you increase the dose and if that's not working, then you use um, additional treatments. <laughs> um, beta agonists are contraindicated um, and you can't administer LABAs without giving an ICS. 
Um, that's an important fact to know. You always have to administer ICS with a LABA, a LABA with an inhaled corticosteroid. These are the list of drugs. These are the adverse effects. These are the common ones. You can do this in your home and your own time. I won't read them out to you. Um, oh, shit. Okay. Um, <laughs> and there's a few other sort of um, more niche ones like leukotriene and ta receptor antagonists and then your biologics, so your monoclonal antibodies. Okay, OSA, so airway, upper airway obstruction. Um, it happens when people sort of have fat upper airways or they've got um, over relaxation of their airways um, and that means their airway collapses, they can't breathe properly. Um, that's pretty much the thing behind it. It's more common in obese, old males. <laughs> um, the way it happens is like when people fall asleep, things start to relax and the airway closes um, and slowly they don't get oxygenation and then they wake up, um, they get that like SNS arousal um, and that has all sorts of bad side effects, that SNS arousal. Um, and then they struggle to sleep because they're constantly in cycles of um, waking up, sleeping because of like hypoxemia and struggling to breathe. Um, risk factors, the big ones, male, large neck circumference and alcohol consumption. That's probably a big one that people don't realize, but it's really big. Um, so think about it. Excessive <laughs> presentation. So they can't sleep properly. They're snoring a lot um, because their like palate is like vibrating. Um, they've got morning headaches, daytime sleepiness. That's a big thing. Um, Definitive test is like polysomnography. So it's about measuring their brain sleep, cardiac, breathing activities. Um, and then there's this sort of severity and you kind of do need to know um, the severity indicator. So mild is five to 15 um, episodes of them stopping breathing or less breathing. Um, in an hour, moderate is 15 to 30 and severe is more than 30. Uh, management, the main thing is like CPAP, it's like putting on a mask to apply positive pressure and it basically just keeps their airways open. Um, but people don't take it because it sucks to take, it's a loud machine, it feels weird and it annoys their partners. Um, complications, so you get your SNS um, complications um, because you got your SNS cardiovascular cold of um, complications because of that over -S overactive SNS um, activation when you're waking up and then there's all these other ones that are like feeling associated so like depression fatigue concentration like those are common sense and then the main thing is like people like crash cars because they're sleepy like common sense okay pleural effusion so like pneumothorax you get an accumulation of fluid instead of air in between the pleural space um, there's two ways you can have it you can have exudative or transudative so exudative is like the actual lung is kind of damaged and so like stuff is just leaking out of the lungs and that's why it's like protein and LDH rich because it's the same um, sort of concentration as like your blood or like fluids and stuff like that. It's got a lot of, it's just like direct exudate um, coming out. Um, infection, infarction, trauma, it's like a local sort of um, pathology, but in transudate it's more systemic. So it's more like the whole body's fucked up. So it's either due to um, increased capillary hydrostatic pressure. So there's too much fluid pushing out all the, um, water and then or there's too little protein so there's little oncotic pressure and so there's not enough fluid being kept into this um, capillaries and so you get fluid moving out um, into the pleural space and that's more to do with like your renal or like cardiac metabolic abnormalities so like a systemic sort of disorder um not important the most important thing is like stony dull percussion notes stony dull is like the key word who knows what stony dull means but stony dull is stony dull it just stands like a rock or something when you percuss on it um and you'll see like characteristic x-ray changes um the one main one to note is blunting of the costophrenic angles um yeah blunting of the costophrenic angles it just look really like smooth um instead of sharp um the way we treat it is we drain the fluid just like we drain the air we can also give like fluid drugs to make them pee a lot um, and that decreases their fluids. Pulmonary embolism. So this is when we got a blood clot and then it gets stuck in one of the arteries in the lungs um, and that has all sorts of consequences. Um, but there's three things which cause blood clot, Verkhaus triad, so hypercoagulability, so hypercoagulable state, stasis, you're not moving or endothelial damage. Um, generally your emboli originate from like um, a thrombus, a clot formation in your legs. Um, you can look through these veins um yeah <laughs> um mp yeah your thrombus like it breaks off embolized so it goes by ivc from the leg into right atrium right ventricle into the pulmonary circulation then it gets stuck there because your pulmonary vessels are really small um 
because there's no blood going there, you get your VQ, VQ ratio changing. So your if there's no blood going there, your ventilation to that same region also decreases. Um, and so that area is not working. Um, you get increased vascular pressure, increased vasoconstriction. Um, yeah, bad. <laughs> um, yeah, because there's less O2, you get hyperventilation. Um, you've got like hypoxemia. And if you're hyperventilating because of that, you can get hypercapnia. Capnia is like reduced CO2 in the blood, bad. Um, risk factors, we talked about this before, but age is a big one. And then um, risk factors for like thrombosis. So like menopausal women, um, oral contraceptive pill, pregnancy, stasis, sitting down on a plane, all that kind of stuff. Um, key features, sudden sharp pain, calf pains, like that's to do with your thrombus. Yeah. Investigations and diagnosis, you don't need to know too much, but like, there's two main things you can either do. You can do um, VQ scans, but we don't really do that because CT pulmonary angiograms are better. You get a direct visualization of the thrombus. What you do, you basically just like put fluid in, see where the fluid stops, and that's where like the clot is because it's blocking all the fluid from going through those vessels. Um, so that's what we do. VQ scan, like it can be different in different people. People can't be ventilating properly, um, or they they can actually be doing their VQ like their v, their VQ ratios can change that um, can mess with our own interpretation of results. Management, we give them anticoagulation therapy, break down the clot, all that kind of stuff. Pancreas tumor, lung tumor in the apex of the lung. Um, various courses, read about them in your own time. Um, the main things to note are it can cause Horner's syndrome. It can cause um, wasting of thinner eminences because it's impinging on brachial plexus sort of things. Um, and it can cause weakness in general. You can get positive Pemberton sign because imagine if that thing is like up there, if you're pushing it all against your um, venous um, vessel, veins and arteries, um, you can get um, blockage of blood and stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, investigations, chest x-ray, CT, and then you take a biopsy and then you treat it with like chemo, radio, surgery. Um, interstitial lung disease, so this is fibrosis of the lungs. It can happen due to environmental causes. So main ones are like silicosis and asbestosis. But a big drug one is methotrexate. Um, so a lot of like immuno like immune problem people. So people have like rheumatoid arthritis and all these immune autoimmune conditions take methotrexate as a big one and they can get interstitial lung disease. Um, yeah, nothing too important to note. Just core pulmonale. Again, if your lungs aren't working properly, there's like increased vascular, vascular resistance because it's trying to push out blood or something. Um, An increased SNS stimulation. Um, and then the dry end inspiratory crackles are important as well. Asbestosis, this is in your quiz. The only known cause of mesothelioma. You don't even know need to know what mesothelioma is, um, but just know that um, buzzword um, happens in people who work with asbestos, obviously. Um, bronchiectasis, so irreversible dilation of airways, um, mainly happens after infections. Um, if there's chronic inflammation, that leads to damage and destruction to the airways, um, and that's bronchiectasis. So mainly in cystic fibrosis, you got a lot of people, they got that build up of mucus, they got chronic infections um, with, what did we learn before? Pseudomonas. Um, <laughs> and that leads to bronchiectasis. Um, so they got this predicted, it's pretty like non-specific symptoms. So like, don't even worry about it, to be honest. Um, aortic dissection. I don't really know why this is in here, but I put it in here. <laughs> um, but it's not that important, honestly. Like this is more cardio. I think it's just like a cause of chest pain. So I put it in. Um, cystic fibrosis, we talked about it before, but again, um, it's like your chlorine channels are fucked up. So if chlorine's not going up, um, if chlorine's not going out of the, um, being secreted from cells, sodium's not being secreted from cells and water's not going into cells. So that makes things really like viscous and non-watery. Um, and that's what blocks up stuff. So like in your pancreas, you can get blockage there because there's chloride channels there. And then you get uh, enzymes being stuck in your pancreas and then things digest, or you can get, um, like stools, like in your stools, if you're not secreting chloride, if, um, in your intestines, then water's not going into your like stools, and then it becomes really bulky and hard because it's dehydrated. And you can also be like infertile because your sperm rely on chloride for some reason. Fun fact. So tubing gets oh, blocks, the, blocks the pipe. Ends. Okay, yeah. there you go. Um, yeah, written here. Mostly we diagnose it when people are infants and neonates. Um, it's very rare to diagnose it when people are adults, but it does happen. Um, but yeah, these are certain things to be aware of. Yeah. Investigation, sweat chloride test, they have high concentration in their sweat. 
Um, and then you do genetic testing after that to like confirm it and make sure. Um, treatment, bunch of different stuff. Um, mucolytics, antibiotics, pancreatic enzyme replacement. And then you just supplement their diet because they're not eating as properly. Um, they're not digesting their things. And then buzzwords. Here's just like a list of buzzwords. Um, last slide. It's pretty, like if you learn this, you should honestly be fine. Um, so lung can like we've already kind of talked about it before. Um, yeah, actually, we've already talked about all these things before. Um, so I won't mention them again. Does anyone have any questions? Because that's the end. <laughs> we finished dead on seven. So like, great oh timing. Oh my god, we did call it. <laughs> <laughs> there are like eight farm slides. Ah, oh, and then there's pulmonary antimicrobials. <laughs> <laughs> but, you can definitely read this but we definitely, that. like we've yeah. done this before and it's a bit of a repeat of the steroids. Absolutely. So breathe easy, it's the end. Thank you for staying tuned with PS Panda. Um, we really appreciate you guys watching. Um, and if you have any questions, you can just send them to us later once you watch the video as well. Um, we'll be posting slides and posting the recorded video on our YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> Like and subscribe. <laughs> um, tell your friends. <laughs> um, yeah, do you guys have anything to say? Nah, to the five people left who are watching. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks for sticking it out. Because um, we're drained, so we can't yeah. imagine how well you guys are feeling. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for sticking around. And everyone who was watching before, thank, thank you, you as well. Before. Yeah. And stay safe in the current health climate stay further away from people than we are yeah, yeah. we're not modeling <laughs> good behavior but close. hand hygiene as well hand hygiene um yeah sandra says thanks yeah <laughs> thank you for listening how do we end um, the okay. I'm gonna end it here oh that's right <laughs> um oh.